My name is Lawrence Caldrick. I'm CEO at West Country Rivers Trust. Um, so um, we wanted to put on an evening for kind of all the people that we work with, we support, who support us um, over the years. Um, and so West Country Rivers Trust is very much a science driven organisation um, and trying to turn that and use that into real practice. So we've we've lined up a um, what we call a speed dating um, ex um, a number of talks. So it's quite a lot of a large number of talks and um, we'll we'll run through them. Um, if anyone's used to it and wants to raise a question, rather than doing formal Q&A sessions, certainly after each talk, um, we're running um, on Slido. So if you go to, if you're on your phones, you can go to www.slido.com. You can actually, without having to register or do anything, you can type in that number. And actually, if you want to raise any questions or say anything, feel free to put them into, um, into Slido. What we'll do is we'll have a look at those over the interval we've got or the break we've got um, and maybe pick up some of them informally. Um, but afterwards, we'll also be trying to capture this all and put it on our website, all the talks and also answer some of the questions that come out. And obviously, each of the present um, presenters, you've got sort of the details on the posters. You'll have the details on the slides and we'll circulate that. So it's really that if there's anything that excites you out of the 10 minute talks, um, feel free to contact the people that are giving the presentation and, and running through that. Um, so I'm going to start off um, really um, in this um, in this uh, event, really about talking about our changing um, catchments and um, what how they've been how climate change is used. And this is around one of our projects called Triple C. Um, it's been working for a few years looking at this issue of of how is climate change shifting how our catchments respond. Um, and so we know sort of what's driving um, climate change. We've got in this um, increase in CO2. We know that's having direct changes to things like the hydrological cycle. Um, and so that's having knock on issues into things like flood risk. It impacts us in water quality, in drought, in all of these different issues. And in the southwest, we're going to sort of the prediction is we're going to get a milder, wetter winters. We're going to see sea level rises. Um, we'll see hotter, drier summers. But when it does rain, we'll get this kind of heavy outburst. And we've seen that over the um, more recent years. So it really is, has become pressing. But alongside that climate, that changing climate, we've also got changing catchments and changing landmass. So back in the 1950s, this is around Stoke Clemson, where our office is based, um, a very small catchment that includes Dutchie College. Um, in the 1950s, it had 45 fields. It had um, very little um, comparative um, nutrients on those fields. It had little compaction of those soils and it had little um, development in there. Scroll forward 70 years and a lot of those field margins have been taken out. The drainage pattern has been simplified. We've got more nutrients. We've got more compaction. We've got more homes in there. So that has a big risk difference to the way water comes out of that catchment. So here on the on the um, on the side is the discharge um, that comes out and the time it takes. So a flood hydrograph, what used to come out of our catchments slowly and cleanly in terms of the water, um, with water being there in the summer months, now comes out quick and dirty. And we're seeing this within some of our probes and some of our data. And you add on climate change, and it means across the catchment we're seeing impacts on our the health of our rivers. So that could be. Um, in the, the reservoirs where we're seeing things like algal blooms. It could be in the rivers themselves where they suffer from sudden reductions in oxygen because of the amount of nutrients or because of other toxic um, inputs like pesticides. We're seeing more flooding of our towns and, and our cities. And within our sort of harbours, we're seeing more need for dredging and that dredging has more and more contaminants in them. So that's causing huge pressures across our, our catchments. Now, all of those pressures sort of need to be dealt with by society. And about 12 years ago, or um, well, less than that, actually nine years ago, we looked at the River Tamar and we started saying, well, how many plans are there that looks at um, these issues? So you have things like the catchment management, uh, capture and abstraction management systems and plans. So that's around to um, whether we've got enough water. We've got things like the water company plans for their drinking water areas. We know that there's the environment agency plans that they had. We know that there were flood risk plans out there. Um, there were the historic things like the salmon action plans out there. There were things like the um, bathing water directives out there. And these are all of the things that are starting to sort of society wants to sort of control and manage. And as you can see, these are all the plans that have some bearing for the River Tamar. So it's a really complex 
issue out there. It's a very messy picture out there. Now, scroll forwards um, five years or so, seven years, and what we've now had is a lot of society wanting to integrate those things, but off the back of it, a lot of partnerships. So these are all the partners, uh, partnerships that have bearing on the River Tamar. And so there's a lot of different, I won't have picked up all of them, but there are lots of different partnerships that pick up lots of different partners, um, whether they be looking at food and provision of, uh, of food and, and drinking water, <clears throat> whether they be looking at um, uh, fisheries, whether they be looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, whether they look at, be looking at carbon sequestration or flood risk management or any of these kind of issues of, of, of wildlife that we face. So as a trust, we're really trying to sort of work out how to integrate that, how to deliver that. And there are four strands that we are kind of really sort of um, a lot of our research, a lot of our work and a lot of our delivery um, centre around. So uh, firstly, um, supporting soils. We set up something called the Devon and Cornwall Soils Alliance to really build the capacity and capability of advice across our, our region and really look at things like regenerative farming and regenerative farmers. And I know there's in the audience, there's a few other people around that are really sort of signed up to that whole way of working. Um, trying to build things like flood resilience within our catchment. So we have several projects working on those elements, which uh, again, soils are fundamental within there. And you'll hear about some of these things that we're picking up today. Another strand is around reconnecting our rivers. We've kind of cut them off over the years with infrastructure, with weirs. I mean, we are 60 million people living on a small island, so it is quite challenging sort of retrofitting our rivers and dealing with some of those structures. But again, we can build that narrative. We can try and start removing some of those barriers, some of those issues, trying to increase the, um, the natural connectivity in our rivers. Some of the other things you'll hear about and we're picking up on is things like how do we wild um, our, our, our river corridors, the wetlands. Uh, some of our past research sh um, shows that 20% of the area of the Tamar used to be wetlands. Now that's down to about 4% of the area. So that has a big issue on sort of how what's buffering our rivers, how water is being held up in our catchments. So again, there's lots of ways for us to try and understand how do we broaden the space for water in our, our catchments. And then finally, one of the things you'll pick up a lot on today, and I'm really pleased some of our citizen scientists and our, um, our community groups have been able to join us, is really connecting the community with their local river and empowering them to be able to understand what's happening in their river and also take action um, within their river. So building the citizen science that we're hearing about today, trying to build, um, get people um, engaged within their river, um, and looking at things like the quality of the river, but also the flooding that they um, they find they're having in the river. So it's really great to be able to invite um, so many of you um, to the room. As I say, we're going to need to really um, join up our systems, uh, both monitoring and integrated delivery, to be able to deliver what we want, which is more resilient catchments and communities. And so hopefully the, um, the talks we've got set up for today will really highlight some of the work we're doing and some of the, um, the, the initiatives we have going. So it's, um, that's it for myself. So thank you for that. And oh, <laughs> so what I'd, so invite the floor. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce um, Nick, who's going to give our next talk, which is really about the, the state of evidence um, relating to our rivers. Um, and um, some of the um, the sort of the issues we have with that, the evidence itself. So Nick, if I could pass over to you. For those who are um, coming up and speaking, you just press the, the lower button and you need to speak into the mic and stick around here because I'm recording it. Sorry, that's the whole load of stuff to enjoy, enjoy Nick. Thanks, I've already got sentry over there. So I give a lot of presentations uh, as part of what I do, but I haven't given, given a presentation to real human beings for about two, I worked out about two years and four months. <laughs> so this is a slightly interesting and exciting time for me, and Lawrence is just going to be about to finish the brilliant submission. <laughs> I just wondering who that fellow on the end was. Two and a half years of lockdown, ages of, ages of, <laughs> ages of the chat. <coughs> okay, so my job um, at West Country Rivers Trust uh, changed um, at Christmas. And I became Director of Evidence and Impact, and my remit now at the Trust is very much to, I've always been the Head of Evidence uh, and Engagement, uh, specialising in data and evidence, but now my role is uh, to take an overview of the whole Trust activities and try and work out how we have an impact, um, how we deliver against our charitable objectives, 
um, and try and work out how everything that we do translates into uh, outcomes uh, out there for our rivers and water environment. Um, and I've called my talk No News is Bad News, and hopefully that will give you a clue as to where I'm headed. Uh, with this and the picture I thought was good because it's just a long path to uh, a lonely road that we're walking, trying to work out whether or not the environment is in a good condition or, or not. And I just wanted to, uh, I was thinking about this quite a lot, and um, as you can imagine, and I wanted to just draw some comparisons in your mind, just place some thoughts in your mind. There's a big difference between knowledge and understanding and awareness. And, and, and there's a big difference between having the capability to do something, and having the capacity to do it. Uh, and there's a big difference between data and evidence. And I was thinking about this, and actually, rather than saying versus, it should say multiplied by. So I'd say impact is knowledge multiplied by awareness, capability multiplied by capacity, data multiplied by evidence. So I'll come, this is, I'll come back to this. But I just want you to keep those things in your mind because these are things, some of these things we are very good at and some of these things we are very bad at. So we're going quite quickly because we've only got 10 minutes. So um, the other thing, I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about these things. And um, when I was at university, I studied a, a module on virology, who knew? Uh, and it scared the whatnot out of me. And so I very quickly decided to move over to the environment. Um, but I, 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 lo I like the, the principles of epidemiology. Um, we're all familiar with them these days. So the key aims of an epidemiologist are to describe the distribution and magnitude of health and disease problems in the human population. They have to identify what they call risk factors or etiological factors in the pathogenesis of disease. So what's wrong with people and what's causing it. They have to gather data essential for design and implementation of services for treatment of disease. And they have to monitor and evaluate the impact of their health interventions and programs, i.e. are they working and they have money. So I was thinking about this. Um, this is John, uh, reworking of John Snow's map uh, when he invented epidemiology to identify a source of cholera in London. This is basically what we do for the environment. We have to work out what's wrong with it. We have to work out where the problems are coming from. We have to design measures and implementations to try and improve its health. And then we have to work out whether or not what we're doing is working. So that's basically the same. So I coined the phrase eco epidemiology, which is university first people. <laughs> so just very quickly focus on the first two bits. So understanding the condition of the environment in order to diagnose what's wrong with it, in order to work out what to do in order to make it better, or indeed to discover there's nothing wrong with it, in which case we're going to do something else. So historical, so we have to look back in order to work out where we're heading. We always have to look back. Um, when I was, I worked in the Environment Agency for a few years, 2008, 9, 10, uh, and in those days, the um, State of the Environment Report was one of a massive team was in the agency. And actually, the State of the Environment Report doesn't happen anymore. But essentially, what the Environment Agency did and, and the Nat National Rivers Authority for them for over 20 years, they used a method called GQA, you probably can't read this, but it's General Quality Assessment. What they did, and that was designed to assess the condition of rivers and water quality. And it was designed to assess the impacts of severe pollution on the water environment. And what they could, they could see was they looked at um, the trends over a long period of time to try and work out whether or not rivers were in good condition, bad condition, getting worse, getting better. And back in 2008, 9, 10, just to pick out some stories, uh, there's a lot of good news stories about rivers. The GQA, as the graph showed, showed that rivers were improving, getting better, everything was absolutely wonderful. And they even released stories of the most improved rivers revealed by the Environment Agency. And you definitely can't read this, but at the bottom of this new story, it says biologically dead. Um, this also includes the River Thames in London, which was declared biologically dead in the 1950s, and the River Tap in South Wales, which the EA says once ran black with coal dust. So that gets you thinking because, okay, it's a good news story, right? But then possibly that's not the whole story. Uh, oh, I just that because I like that picture. Um, you can't read it, but there's loads of people moaning in Victorian times about the fact that the river is nasty and killing them in the middle. So what I'm trying to say there is that we're starting from a low, low baseline. So in order to, if you're assessing the health of the rivers compared to biologically dead, then anything that isn't biologically dead is significantly better. But at the same time as all this news was coming out, we all we kind of knew that everything wasn't right. We're getting really loads of bad news stories about rivers. Um, I had a picture of David Wylinch because he swam the length of the Thames and nearly died of some horrific parasite that he contracted. Um, 
you know, so the river, the river tends to biologically be dead, but you wouldn't want to swim in it, is basically the real message. So what they realised is that GQ wave is not sensitive enough to detect the effects of diffuse pollution on rivers. And so, and then at that time in 2000, the Water Framework Directive came around, and this was a game changer. And the UK and scientists and the researchers, many of whom are in this room, um, started uh, to establish what was called UK TAG, which was the UK Technical Advisory Group for Water Framework Directive. And the UK established itself as a world leader in the science of water quality and water body health assessment. We did a site to deliver water body assessments. Hundreds, thousands of water bodies across the country were assessed by a whole suite of different measures. And suddenly we had a tool, uh, a really safety art approach to working out the health of rivers. Which was good. Unfortunately, what that meant was that then everything was bad because we had a proper way of looking at rivers and their health, and suddenly the news was that the rivers were failing. And but so, so then what happened? Ten years have gone past since that happened, and we've continued to fight and fight and fight to try and try and keep this show on the road. In 2009, 121 water bodies. In the same art on the right there, 22 of good ecological status, um, and there's a whole load of stuff coming, still coming out in 2018 from the Environment Agency, saying you know, cleanest bathing water since records began, serious pollution incidents are down, rivers that were biologically dead are reviving. Although I don't, I'm not 100 sure how that happens, but it kind of does. Um, we've got 10 years of arguing about it, and then in 2019. 23% of water bodies are in good ecological status, which is no different. But the, the key thing is that only 56 water bodies still exist. So 100, no, sorry, 50, 60, 70 water bodies no longer exist. So that's a bit of a worry. And then, and then it's due to great, there's been a huge Ferrari. So what I'm saying is for 10 years, we've been very, very knowledgeable and clear in our evidence of understanding the state of our rivers, but no one in the country talks about it. The awareness was really, really low. Then suddenly, everything switched. The Rivers Trust released their State of Rivers report, which confirmed everything, something that we already knew, which is that no, no water bodies in the country met good chemical status. Ecological health was good ecological status was down to 14% of rivers. Uh, and, you know, you know always, but it's the same story as we've had all along, which is that it's bad and it's still bad. And then, and then it broke into the into the mainstream, into the news. We had Panorama, we had Water UK responding, we've had documentaries about the state of our rivers, everyone's shouting and screaming about how bad it is. Um, everybody is talking about rivers and how important they are and how bad it is, which is a good thing. Uh, even I like Shark Shark Church, Save Britain's Rivers, excellent. That's wonderful to have her on board. Uh, and it's slightly with a bit of, you know, uh, shag around that I say this because We've been badgering on about rivers for years and years and years, and no one's paid us the blindest bit of notice. Uh, but suddenly, you know, it, it's caught up. But the key thing with this is that all of this information that's been used in State of the Rivers Report, the Water UK, uh, um, um, reasons for failure information, all of the information that's driving the uh, huge hoopla about rivers that there is in the media now, is all coming from the same source, the same set of data, which is the Environment Agency's monitoring of the Environment Force Framework Directive. So the question is, is this information actually good, good enough? It's good enough to drive the debate about the rivers, but is it actually good enough to inform the, the restoration of rivers? Um, and so really just to finish, so trying to put this systematically, government funded monitoring of the water environment has changed during this 10 years of arguing. We haven't seen a continuous level of effort and intensity of monitoring over that time. What we've seen is quite a rapid uh, step downward series of steps. And Simon, if you notice this in these slides, um, we've seen a real tailing off of the monitoring intensity of the environment. So the information that went into the State of the Rivers Report in 2021 was the same kind of data as was used in 2009, but it's not the same because the amount of samples, the amount of information that sits within it is a lot less. So it's the same evidence, but without the same fundamental data that sits in the back end of it. So you can't see this uh, because it's very, very small, but essentially what this shows is, is that what I just described, which is the dropping, dropping away of the environment agency monitoring 
is two maps. Uh, in 2000, 1,183 phosphate results from 100 unique locations in the Tamar averaged 12 tests per stock per year, which isn't quite enough anyway. In 2019, uh, 63 results in 21 unique locations averaged three tests per site per year. So I had a conversation, an argument, you might call it, with someone from the Environment Agency when they did their strategic monitoring review. And he said, our statistician tell us there's no statistical difference between 12 samples a year and three samples a year. And I said, that's because they're both equally useless in terms of working out what the state of the limit is. Having said that, 12 samples a year, if you look at multiple years, that does start to build up a significant amount of samples, which can give you really useful information. Three samples a year, a tenth of the number of sites. Um, can't give you that level of insight. So, we'll, so this is what, where we are in terms of that, that monitoring, and it's troubling, but the key message here is that there is hope. The reason there is hope is because, as you're about to hear in a whole series of talks through this evening, that we, we do have all of the answers, we do have all of the tools that we need in order to meet this challenge. So this is where I was saying about the difference between capability and capacity. We have the ability to do this monitoring. We have the techniques, we have the science, we have the expertise in order to meet this challenge. What we don't have at the moment is the resource in order to do it effectively everywhere. And so this is where the big rallying cry should be, is yes, of course, we need people to take responsibility for our rivers, but we also need people to value monitoring the environment so that we can actually target and design and deliver the interventions that we need. So what do we do now? That's my question. So, Naturally, despite that, there's not much we can do about some of that stuff, but most importantly, our focus has been on the three and four, which is to gather the data we need in order to target what we want to do. So I'll just use this as a... So, so we use um, models, particularly, to, to target our actions, um, but at a very, very small scale, a catchment scale. We um, use surveys, um, out and about soil condition assessments, farm surveys, walkover surveys, and you're going to hear more about these during the course of the evening. Um, we use water quality monitoring that we do ourselves, um, led by Simon and, and, and Joe and others in the team now, uh, in the evidence and engagement team. Um, and we have a huge array of tools at our disposal, incredibly innovative, state of the art techniques, passive sampling, you're going to hear about a bit later from Ian. Uh, we, are, we are leading, I think, one of the country's leading citizen science programmes in relation to water quality and the environment. That's uh, something we're very proud of. You're going to hear from Lydia in a moment about that. Uh, and, and, and my role, as I said at the start, is to start evaluating the impact of our work using modelling, yes, monitoring chemical, biological monitoring, to try and assess the efficacy and the impact of the actions that we're taking. So hopefully, Everything will come together perfectly and we'll be delivering the right interventions in the right place for the right reason and getting the outcomes that we so desperately need for our rivers. And we'll start seeing 14%, maybe becoming even 15% over the short term of water bodies within status. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I'm Lydia Rashworth, and yes, I work for Western Tree Rivers Trust as an evidence agent. So, oh, wrong way. And a large part of my role is our West Country Citizen Science Investigations and running the scheme. And so today I'm going to talk about how these volunteers are taking up um, the monitoring in lieu of what makes us lack of monitoring. So what is West Country CSI? So it is a volunteer monitoring uh, water quality scheme and it's based on um, two sides they thought, the observational um, parameters in, for our rivers, so things like wildlife, um, plants, the surrounding landscape, visible pollution, um, both sources and evidence of, and then we also give them a low cost water quality kit, um, so it's with this we choose measuring suspended sediments, uh, total dissolved solids from but also measures temperature um, and phosphate strips as well. All of this data is entered onto an online platform Cartographer, and that's easily by, by us. Um, and as you can see, over the years, it started in 2016 um, in quite a small project on Tamar actually, and it's really radiated 
out. So these are all the samples that have ever been taken by us, which is six hundred volunteers. Um, and that is, you know, over 850 people sign up um, online. And about 200 of those are active at uh, one time. So it's a, a really excellent way of, of spreading uh, our knowledge and understanding of the West Country. Um, from a small project, um, the, the project finished and I think it shows how interested people are in the state of their rivers because despite lack of funding, it's still gone up. And so it's been supported by various dis different projects. It's had its own little pots of funding. Um, but these have been quite concentrated in certain areas. But actually from this map, you can see that the spread is quite large. So actually it shows that people are willing to take up that call of, I, I want to fill those gaps. I want to know what's going on in my rivers. And there's no, if there's no statutory monitoring going on, I'm happy to fill so looking at the growth, um, if you look at the number of samples and, and the number of samplers over the years, um, it's been a steady rise. Um, 2020 obviously was a pandemic year, but that kind of almost <laughs> gave it a massive boost. And you saw in 2021, um, you know, a, a huge leap in the number of surveys and the number of people signing up. Um, and in 2022, we're, we're projected for uh, 3,500 surveys, um, which would be really impressive, uh, considering in 2020 we had 1,000 surveys. Um, so there's, there's definitely a, a real will um, amongst everybody in this region to collect data on their rivers. What do we do with this? data. So um, as of 2020, um, we started doing a bit of analysis. So we decided water bodies with over 12 samples, as Nick was talking about, that idea that, you, you know, ideally we want 12 samples a year to give a general river health score. Um, and so we've taken, taken those those parameters that the, the volunteers are measuring, so pollution, the ecology, suspended sediments, um, phosphate and dissolved solids, and worked out an overall health score for our water bodies. And not only is it good for us to have a look at this, but also it's excellent feedback for the volunteers who are doing an amazing effort on the ground. So, as you can see in 2020, we had 25 scorecards, so you know, fairly well spread out, but very sporadic. Um, so that's us at building block. We said, OK, right, we need to spread this. We've got over 850 water bodies in the West Country area. Um, and really, ideally, we'd love one person in each of those water bodies collecting data and, and observations. Um, so in 2021, you can see we're starting to get there. We're starting to get a bit more spread. We're starting to see more water, water bodies being covered. Um, we've, we've now got 80 scorecards for 2021, um, so it's a big increase. Um, and hopefully, we're going to see, see a year on year rise in that. And, and as Nick was saying, that idea that year on year data and collecting that consistently can then start to give us a good evidence base. And we can start to probe things like phosphate, for example, and have a look at the areas that you're seeing the highest phosphate, and the areas that you can start targeting um, for projects and, and you know areas that need the help the most help. So having a look at the, the value of citizen science data, um, now I think. Everything that is being collected by the citizen scientists is important. I put up a picture of Himalayan Bolson there because I think even the idea that the, the volunteers are out there collecting data on the problem plants is hugely significant for the different bodies. For example, about the National Park wanting to know what invasive species up there are in that area. And of course, as an organisation, they might have one or two ranges out and about and they might be spotting a few here and there. But if you have, you know, a load of citizens out there taking that data, that's an excellent resource. Um, and it can be that that data can then be used, you know, not only for decision making, but for potential funding as well going forward. Obviously, having a lot of people out there 
is going to provide more frequency, so you're going to get more data coming in, and the spatial extent as well is going to be far greater than any government or, or you know, organisation, whether it be a, a university or an NGO, can create. What we're also seeing is a rise in groups getting involved in West Country CSI, which we think is hugely beneficial, um, not only because it collects consistent and valuable data because they work as a, as a team and as a group, but they also can you know, put pressure on local MPs, councillors, those people that can you know, make a difference in a local area, you know, maybe not on a national scale, but certainly on, a, on that localised um, nature, which, which we, see, we see day to day can be hugely beneficial and have a knock-on effect to a wider area. And for us as well, you know, we have projects obviously around the West Country and a lot of the, the things we're doing on the ground can be evidenced by the, the volunteers that are out there. Instead of one person from our monitoring team trying to collect all of that data, they can be supported by those that are collecting data, you know, monthly, weekly. So I just wanted to bring up a few examples of where we've seen how having informed and educated eyes and ears out on the ground to make a difference. So on the far left there you've got a nice picture of a cheese and river um, and it was highlighted by one of our, our volunteers and phoned in. Um, nothing really was done about it as I'm sure you know a lot of our volunteers have experienced. Um, but we helped to put pressure in the right areas. Um, and this was picked up by the Environment Agency and it turned out that, that there was in fact a cheese at through the VT um, a pipe similar to as we can see in the bottom right there, you, you know, the, the well documented things. So bravery issues, um, you know, that any our volunteers was picking up and say, hang on a minute, this is hugely high conductivity, what's going on? Um, and also, you know, the, the, the impact of, of sewage works and how volunteers go about that, you know, we can support that. Um, you know, the, the knock-on effect down the line could be more significant because there's data out there, there's eyes and ears out there on the ground. So I think what's really important to highlight here is that it's, our West Country CSI programme isn't just about data, it's very much about education and informing and radiating the impacts of our rivers and, and and the knowledge in our rivers as well. The more we know about something, the more we care about it. Simple fact. So, you know, getting people out there in their groups, such as we have here tonight, what we've seen is a, an amazing radiation. So, you know, we might train one group, but suddenly you've got four or five groups in the local area wanting to get involved. And that is hugely beneficial as a trust, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people interested in their rivers and through the interest and the engagement, we're then seeing improvements in rivers. So I like this slide because these two quotes really sum up West Country CSI as a scheme. It's about the data, but it's also about people connecting to their river and understanding it better. As Volunteer monitoring is becoming more and more important. Um, you know, we've got really, uh, the, the Carscape project, which is going to be coming in, in, into the national framework, looking at, at national system science and how that can be applied um, across the board. I think West Country CSI and certainly volunteer monitoring is going to become more and more um, important and evident as we go, as we go forward. Um, so thank you very much, and I'm probably short of the time a bit, so there you go. <laughs> no, it's, it's amazing seeing um, the, the, the speed at which system science has developed and the power of it. I'm really pleased some of the guys that are out doing those system science um, tests and, and activities are here because it's just really raising the profile of the pressure space um, and trying to get people um, delivering that has always been uh, 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 and shouting that message from the rooftop challenge. I want to hand over now um, to um, to Sean, who we've been working with for, uh, for a long time. I'll write up, just before I do though, I'll write up the, the numbers, sign it under if you do want it, at 340 
I'll just put it on the board over here. Um, and just to um, be able to catch uh, any questions you have, and um, we'll we'll go into an informal QA in the break anyway, so you'll get a chance to answer. Anyway, John, over to you. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, in the absence of a world-renowned environmental chemist like Fergal Sharkey, <laughs> I, I saw that picture, Nick. You know exactly how to push all my buttons. Anyway, <laughs> hot off the uh, pyramid stage from Glastonbury, I managed to get back there in time to talk to you about a study and a joint bit of work that we did together over the last few years. Uh, just com well, it was completed, and the good news is, all done by Lauren Dawson, or the late work at least. She got her PhD, her PhD confirmed on Friday. So that's excellent. So I'm just going to quickly run through um, what we did uh, and how we work together, really. So an academic input, myself and, and Richard Sanford here as well, helping Lauren uh, and adding in with a jointly funded 50-50 um, sort of funded PhD between us and the Rivers Trust about how you can improve water quality. This is a good news story. So uh, on the... the, the uh, the kind of West Front Street uh, Lewis Trust site, we had Bruce and, and Adrian helping out as well. It was one of the few days I could get a picture where it wasn't raining on Dartmoor. <laughs> I can show you a thoroughly miserable place. I'm much more of an excellent person myself. Uh, so, the problem is uh, acidity. Uh, the moorland waters are naturally acidic because of the peat peatland areas. And as that peat um, sort of grows and breaks down, it produces humic acids, which is that cold tea kind of material that you see in upland rivers. That should be just, just about acidic. The problem is because of acid rain over years and years of, since the Industrial Revolution, some of our rivers have got washed out, um, well, have had the precipitation of the acid rain from sulfur, sulfur dioxide turning into sulfuric acid. And that means when it rains, that acid washes into the river. And we've seen pH levels in, in the West Dart, uh, the Upper West Dart, down to pH 2.9. That's kind of like vinegar levels. And fish can't spawn under those conditions. And we know we've got a lot of problems with salmon. Uh, numbers are declining year on year on year. It's not just acidity. There's a whole, whole lot of pressures on salmon because they go from the river to the sea through estuaries. But it is a big contributing factor. And the West Dart was singled out somewhere that wasn't recovering as quick as other rivers because of, of, of historic acidity. So what we were looking at was doing a pilot trial to show can we change the pH of the river, take off some of these low um, troughs in pH, and that would maybe, if you did it on a large scale, uh, improve water quality. <clears throat> now, yes, it's some kind of complicated, interesting kind of chemistry associated with um, pH because it affects aluminium. Aluminium can be quite toxic under sort of acidic conditions. And on here, I'm just going to show you really, this is um, sort of uh, flow in the river. When you get a high flow, it's rained quite heavily, you get these drops in pH down towards three. Fish need to spawn in at least pH 5.5. So this is the West Dark here at two bridges, the pH consistently lower than that value. So what can we do about sort of improving that? And the way around that basically was to put in something that will neutralize it. You know, if you put bicarbonate of soda into your your um uh, your, your your vinegar at home, you'll get it fizz and it will neutralize it. And we wanted to do that on a fairly reasonable scale to add carbonate into the river when it's raining heavily to wash out and neutralize these nasty dips in pH which are obviously going to be toxic because they would release lots of kind of bioavailable aluminium that will cause toxicity. <laughs> this has been shown to work. So we it was first trialled a lot in the Scandinavian countries because they had it really bad acid problems, and more locally in the River Wine. They did this on a fairly industrial scale. Uh, it was a different issue because there's a lot of coniferous forestry there that contributed to the, um, the acidity. But they put in hundreds of tons a year, tipped into the headwaters. It wasn't subtle, but it was effective. They raised the pH and they started changing the biology, and salmon numbers have improved throughout the, the upper regions of the wild. 
So what we did was because the environment agency were quite nervous about us mucking about with the chemistry of the water, we ended up having to put the sand as up to four millimetre calcium carbonate locally mined up by Ashburton, just on the edge of the wall. We put in sort of big sausages that were in mesh bags, so it would wash out when it was, the flow was high and sort of reduce the acidity to a degree. But if there was any problems, we could whip those bags out very quickly. That was phase one. And Lauren showed that you can't change the pH overnight. This was enough. But what we want to do is put the concept. And the first thing that changes is the diatoms, the little the, the, the kind of biofilm that you find, slippery things, the brown slippery muck you get on, on stones. So if you look under a microscope, they are diatoms and they will change. And we showed very quickly that the addition of carbonate would improve the ecology at the diatom scale quite quickly. So if you put more in over time, then you would eventually start having the effect to actually help the fish. Phase two involved um, the Rivers Trust, pretty much um, after um, Lauren finished her PhD, putting in a without bags at the side of the river and allowing it to wash in over the time. So we basically demonstrated a combination of um, with, uh, pH monitoring in the river, physically kind of putting this carbonate in, we showed we could improve water quality. And we had these uh, monitors in upstream downstream to be able to show scientifically that there were improvements and we could move closer to that pH threshold that will support salmon um, spawning. So overall then, um, we showed the basic dosing up of uh, West Art was achievable without any other ecological detriments. Uh, we found that bank side dosing was more effective than putting in bags because we get more in, as simple as that. But we need more, we need tons, like they are doing on the, uh, the River Wire. And it will take a, a very long period of time to get to achieve what we're trying to recover. Natural recovery is desired, but we know we need to monitor and it probably nature does need a helping hand. So in the short long term aims of taking this project forward is to replace short term active management with landscape recovery and natural acidity buffering in the longer term, uh, a continuation of trial with increased scale and to really to look to achieve that good ecological status above pH 5.5. So in terms of like, you know, how we've worked together, really, what we are trying to do is to kind of have the experience of the, the Plymouth boat in terms of our analytical capability. We've got fantastic laboratories, lots of equipment. We've got sensors. If anyone was here this afternoon to hear about that, all about the work that we've been doing on that and the Leo lab. And we've got catchment and environmental scientists. The Rivers Trust, obviously, have got a massive fisheries experience. They are in touch with the landowners, the catchment specialists, and they themselves, as you've already heard, have monitoring expertise. In the middle, you know, using that, we can get funding, we can take that collaborative approach, and we've all got basically a passion for the environment. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, um, Sean. That was brilliant. Uh, we're starting to get um, some questions come through um, the Slido. Um, so I've the third that one, but it's um, here. You can just put those in, um, and I'll be picking them up in the break time, sort of um, and drawing people out to, to to cover them. So if you've got something, it's quite hard to see. That's three four zero six four zero two. I think any of the other, in fact, the other, if there are rivers trust people at the table, it might be worth noting that down. Um, so what I'd like to do um, now is introduce um, Do uh, Joe Dixon, who's one of the newer members of, of the team, to talk about some of the issues we have with the phosphates um, in our rivers as well. So go over to you. And then that's just uh, down, yeah, down that one. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. Um, good to meet you, Dr. Lawrence. And um, just to give you a little bit of background information, I did my own PhD here at the University of Plymouth about 25 years ago, which was a bit scary school. Um, that PhD is on uh, trace metal particle water interactions in the land ocean coastal zone. Following that, I did 25 years at Plymouth Marine Laboratory as a researcher where I looked at a variety of topics covering trace metal biogeochemistry, nutrient cycling, sources and sinks, microbial transformations of a huge array of volatile organic carbon compounds. So um, I joined the Trust about two months ago, and I'd just like to talk something to you tonight, a little bit about um, phosphates in our rivers. 
So um, this is a nice photo of the upper catchment of the um, Camel Estuary, and I think everybody in this room will agree that what we want are naturally healthy and vibrant rivers supporting rich biodiversity. Now, if we have, as we had from Nick earlier, this is generally speaking what we don't have. So um, what's the problem with phosphate in our rivers? Well, essentially, too much of anything in life inevitably is a bad thing. So too much phosphate sort of pushes the system out of equilibrium and enables the rapid growth of one plant or algal species. So you get unsighted. Eutrophication then causes um, a real problem. Back on. <laughs> Um, it, it really causes um, uh, loss of biodiversity when you get decomposition of plants, which can lead to rapid oxygenation. So, as well as looking terrible, it also increases the cost of um, drinking water and production of subsequent treatments. Nine times out of ten, phosphorus is the most common cause of water quality failures um, in, in England. And we saw these stats a bit earlier when Nick presented them, so I won't dwell on them. Yeah. So um, in that EA report, it also um, said I spotted it with my eagle eyes. The further attention should also be given to tackling more smaller rural sewage sources. So I have to show this data. This is my, my first data for the West Country Villas Trust. And this shows um, phosphorus or total phosphate concentrations really by available gloss in um, the Tavy catchment. So you can see automatically that the concentration at the end here is rather large, over 1.5 milligrams per litre. Um, this is here, a small stream in, in Buckland, Monopora, just south of Buckland, Monopora. And you can pick up higher concentrations um, here um, at Dunham Bridge. So I was a bit worried about this, so I went back, thought I need to check this out, and we um, sampled a week or so later, and I went in higher concentrations. So then we were getting concentrations in excess of about two. So to be absolutely sure, I used my CSI kit and I convinced myself that this was real. That's definitely blue. Um, <laughs> so then, then, then a colleague at West Country Viewers Trust said, you know, those types of concentrations are really normally indicative of um, sewage after a side benefit. So then I went on to the Rivers Trust sewage map, and lo and behold, in between here and here, there's a tenfold increase in um, peak concentration. And so it's not difficult to work out where possibly the main candidate is for where that phosphorus is coming from. So what are the sources of P then? Well, generally speaking, the two big hit is an agricultural water industry, which is no, no big news to anyone in this room. But there is significant local and regional variability. For example, the camel catchment, about 68% approximately of the fresh water pea comes from livestock, which compares to someone like the Axon Brew in Somerset, where it's more like 60% coming from wastewater and wastewater treatments. Um, so why have I picked these two examples? Well, this is because these two form um, two of three areas in the southwest, including the Axe catchment, which constitutes demonstrated two of the new EU programme that's been working with the EU Transform and um, AR. And this is really um, looking at whether the final goal of this really is looking at whether we can come up with nutrient training solutions. So the background to this, but sorry, why these catchments? These catchments are all SAC and Triple SI or Ramsar areas. So the drivers for these SACs are basically enigmatic species of the camels, such as the otter and the bottom dwelling bullhead fish. In the river axe, uh, the driving features are these flowering in situ plant species, which are some of the levels and walls and more of a habitat that it creates for uh, birds and uh, overwintering and waterfowl. So um, increased nutrients in rivers is now having real world consequences. What do I mean by that? Well, there was a recent real landmark ruling in the European Court of Justice, 
known as the Dutch nitrogen case. They essentially ruled that where an internationally important site is, is failing uh, due to elevated nutrient concentrations, so be that phosphorus or nitrogen, a planning permission cannot be legally granted until a development can be proven to be nutrient neutral. So that has major, major implications. This is a real game changer. And what that resulted in was naturally England was writing to all of these councils um, on the bottom there. And basically, development clauses being put in all of these catchment areas. And development will not be granted planning now until all that development can be proven or shown to be nutrient neutral. So one of those areas is the camel catchments. So we're just going to start work on the camel now. So the area highlighted in blue is the area that has to be shown to be nutrient neutral in terms of new planning applications. So I've illustrated on this map the south areas, which is essentially the river. So you've got the Allen, the Camel, the De Lank, and the Lower Boots on, on, on the more southerly. So I've, I've just taken some environmental agency data just to illustrate here. So you've got Delaval on the top right here. This is far left of the sewage treatment works, and you can see the concentrations are around 0.5. Interestingly, there's a different of 20, which is subsequently recovered. So it's interesting to speculate that was that anything to do with the lack of tourism during those COVID years. On the bottom is Nan Stalin. So Nan Stalin receives the sewage from Bodmin and um, it pretty much looks to me that they've put the phosphate stripping in between 2020 and 2021. These concentrations of the final level have reduced from 2 to just below 0.5 milligrams per litre now. Um, but nevertheless, if you look from the graph on the top left, um, it shows you the in situ concentrations in some um, rivers. And the red lines are the environmental quality standards required for South Africa and Versailles regions. So you can see that pretty much in all those cases, the concentration of phosphorus is well exceeding those environmental quality standards. So that's uh, some interesting map. So um, we saw these earlier in, in, in mixed talk, actually. So this is just a, quite a nice visual, but certainly shows that the River Allen. The lower movement and Lanny Brett, the forest streams are in, in poor ecological health. The map on the left it shows you the population, de population, the density of sewage treatment discharges, both water company and non water company, so the septic tanks, and the number of overflows in those regions. So the bigger brown circle, the more overflow events for longer durations. So what are we going to do about it? Well, as Nick said earlier, and when I actually started to look at the data, what data was available for camel catchment in terms of institutional phosphorus concentrations, the data was really, really patchy, not only in terms of spatial coverage, but also in terms of technical coverage. So I uh, devised a, a new monitoring plan, so I'll be starting that in the next week or so, um, with the view of getting really good baseline data so we really know what's happening in this catchment based on a time and space. <laughs> and then we'll be working with our land team to put in various um, in interventions and we're primarily considering riparian buffer zones, wooded and restoring weapons. So we can really get a handle hopefully on how good these sorts of interventions are in reducing the phosphate load to our rivers. So finally, just a quick little plug. I have I've retained some sort of a scientific interest going forward, and I'm really interested in um, developing some uh, postgraduate studentship projects. So perhaps one on looking at uh, manganese recycling in the foyer stream, but there's a bit of a problem with surplus water or struggling with at the minute. I'd also really like to develop a um, nutrient sort of phosphorus and um, PhD. A proposal to work alongside the EU Transform AR project that we're working on, the view to really sort of getting into the detail a little bit more, looking at the role of organic phosphorus to total P budgets, uh, and also picking up a little bit on my volatile organics background, perhaps looking at the source of the zinc for microbial transformations, the key colour compounds such as Jocelyn. So, um, that's all I have to say, so thank you very much. <laughs>
So you've obviously picked up the um, issues of, uh, of nutrient neutrality and phosphates, and we're getting some really good questions coming through. So as I say, we picked that up in an informal <coughs> Q&A session. But it's not just um, the phosphates in the river that we're kind of interested in. There's a whole plethora of, of pollutants. Um, we're really keen to be able to understand what's happening. And so I'd like to pass you over to Ian. Um, and that's, that's Thank you, Lawrence. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'll confess straight away, I'm an interloper from East Devon. I'm a massive Exeter City supporter here in Plymouth, but I'm sure you'll forgive me for that. Um, yes, uh, I'm part of the evidence and uh, part of the monitoring team at uh, West Country Rivers Trust. I worked there for about three years after a very long career in South West Water, where I specialise in uh, organic microbes. Anyway, I'd like to start with a couple of thank yous. One to Sean for putting up that horrendous slide of aluminium chemistry, which means I feel a little less guilty about talking to you about some proper chemistry tonight. Uh, and then secondly to Nick for his own inimitable style of pointing out just how important monitoring really is. Uh, and um, amongst uh, 150 plus projects, I think Lawrence probably more than that would be. Uh, our road of trust monitoring under the windows, a very high percentage of those. So, as I say, the monitoring is fundamental to what we do. We're constantly looking to um, uh, diversify our arsenal of monitoring techniques at the trust. Uh, uh, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about a proposed project that will hopefully do exactly that. So poor ecology in the waterfalls isn't always down to what we call traditional sort of gross blooms, things like phosphate, sediment input, uh, general uh, organic uh, loading in rivers from things like uh, wastewater, silage, liquor, that sort of thing. Sometimes the uh, insidious effects of trace pollutants can be really important. So um, I'm probably preaching with converted when I tell you that trace blooms are important, but there are just three examples um, of things that can cause uh, you know, fairly significant issues down at perhaps even the nano ground bleeder level, something like metaldehyde. That was the active component in uh, slug pellets. Uh, was banned for use on ethanol crops uh, this March, actually. That's incredibly difficult to remove from drinking water once it's in the water. Uh, Cypermethrin, very, very toxic synthetic pyrethroid, which was used previously a lot in sheep dipping, is still used uh, in agricultural as well as agriculture insecticide and can really decimate uh, invert populations at uh, low ground bleed levels and then on the right there. Uh, PBDEs, polybrominate and diphenol ethers. Uh, then flame retardants are very bioaccumulative, they build up in body fat. Uh, they infect top predators in food chains and have all kinds of rather nasty uh, uh, toxicological effects. And so we want a better means of assessing the impacts of these low level uh, contaminants, really. And I could see how we joined the trust that that was an area we, we could really do with improving our act, if you like, and hence the genesis of what we rather pretentiously call the top project, um, but <laughs> I think it probably is quite good, but I'm not sure it was that good. Um, but that, that's the Trace Organics Profile project. And our long term aim using this project is to develop a truly exhaustive trace pollutant profile for all of our key waterfalls. And so, yes, it's a, it's a kind of El Dorado monitoring vision, if you like. So what we want is a procedure where we can detect and semi-quantify really an unprecedentedly wide range of trace pollutants in water courses. We want to do that high sensitivity, so then at around the nanogram bleeder level, if possible, for trace pollutants, so trace organic pollutants and heavy metals. Uh, spanning a very large polarity range, quite a big molecular weight range, and we'd like to actually be able to semi quantify those things. So, what, what do we need to do that? Well, we need to combine a truly broad brush sampling procedure 
So some kind of sampling procedure that can capture this huge range of pollutants. Uh, we need access to high powered analytical kit. If we couple the two together, then hopefully we can get a very a, a truly exhaustive trace pollutant screening method. Well, the kit already exists, the analytical kit, there's quite a bit of it, for example, here in the labs at Plymouth uh, Uni. So for the organics, talking about coupling uh, chromatographic techniques such as gas and liquid chromatography with various configurations of mass spectrometer uh, and ICPMS for the trace metals. Um, recent advances in mass spectrometry, high, high resolution mass spectrometry, and some of the data mining techniques we can use on the sort of big data you'll get from this kind of monitoring is inevitably going to play a, a, a critical role in this. We should be able to carry out analysis for uh, targeted lists of compounds for uh, known unknowns, in other words, uh, lists of blooms that exist in databases, and perhaps even some unknown unknowns, and that's that sounds a bit like probably good, but that's essentially using the high resolution capacity of uh, modern mass spectrometers to identify something from scratch. So just from its mass spectrum without any kind of library or any kind of database. And we'd like to build in some work in that area to this project. And what we want to do then is semi-quantify our detected compounds so that we can pick up uh, trends in the characteristic pollutant profile of a given water course uh, and look at how they change seasonally, but also identify when new pollutants appear or when the concentrations of existing pollutants uh, change and really produce what you might term a heat maps for our key water courses. So the analytical kit exists. We need is the sampling method that will capture this wide range of very wide range of, of balloons. And inevitably here, I think passive sampling has to play a key role. So some of you might be aware of passive sampling, they are continuing continuous sampling techniques. So unlike spot sampling or grab sampling, where we go out and fill a bottle up and see what was in the sample at 1138 on the 28th of June. Uh, these samplers are constantly sampling when they're in the river. And that photo is actually three chem capture devices, which are a type of passive sampler uh, uh, on the lid of a sample, the other side of the lid of a sampling cage after they've been in, I think it was the River X for, for a fortnight, they've just been retrieved from the river to be taken back to the lab, extracted and analyzed. Um, these are generally speaking low tech, low cost sampling methods. You can use them in the targeted mode where you've actually calibrated your samplers for particular compounds. But for this particular project, what's important is you can use them in the screening mode as well. As so you have to run through the costly calibration exercises, you're basically using the samplers to give you uh, an indication of the range of pollutants you've got and roughly what concentration there has in that. Uh, if you calibrate them, samples, you can actually obtain time weight and average calibration and concentrations of pollutants. And at the trust, we have used samples in the past to look for specific classes of pollutants uh, and obtain that sort of quantitative data, uh, acid herbicide, for example. What's really important is that various configurations of these samples are available. Uh, and they, they have their own capabilities to capture different types uh, uh, of pollutant and, that, and coupling that together in this project is what's key. So to do our full brush sampling, we'd probably be looking at using five different types of passive sampler. Three types of the can capture on our device, which you can see at the top there on the left, that should be able to capture between them uh, mid-range polarity organics, uh, acidic organics like acidic pesticides, a lot of acidic pharmaceuticals. Uh, and then a normal piece of work would be to develop uh, cation uh, exchange passive samples that can capture basic pollutants. So uh, there are some very important basic pollutants that aren't monitored that much, so things like the breakdown products of um, 
catalytic surfactants, for example, and I'm sure there are plenty of them in the environment from all the hand gel we've been using in recent years. Uh, but also a lot of pharmaceuticals, basic pesticides, things like that. And that will be a new piece of research to be done in this uh, in this project. And all of those would be analysed, the extracts from those samples would be analysed by the control of the mass spectrometry. And then in the centre of the top there, that's actually just a piece of rubber, silica rubber sheeting. And that's, that kind of sample is very good for non-polar organic compounds, so very uh, hydrophobic compounds. Uh, uh, things like a lot of legacy pollutants like PCBs, organic chlorine pesticides, things like that. They'd be analysed by uh, GCMS, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. And lastly, on the right there, uh, that's a what's called a DGT sample. Uh, and we don't need to worry about what that is, but it's basically a sample that collates heavy metals out of water. And that analysis will be done by ICPMS. So by using those five different types of sampler, we can hope, uh, hopefully obtain that huge cross-section of, uh, of pollutants or information on that huge cross-section of pollutants. Here's, a bit, here's an example of some data obtained by coupling passive sampling, in this case with liquid photography mass spectrometry. So this is just using one of the types of sampler I alluded to there. Is some work that was done in South Africa, looking at two very badly polluted rivers. As you can see, that particular type of sample picked up uh, well over 200 different trace pollutants in those two rivers, uh, at spanning uh, the different categories you can see down the bottom there. So that's pretty powerful stuff, uh, and that's only one of the types of sample we would anticipate using in, in the top project. So the key, key requirements for the project, well, we need the input of expert collaborators, definitely, uh, in experimental design and to interpret all that data. We already have some very strong links with people like Shaw uh, uh, and, and the University of Plymouth, but also Natural Resources Wales is a, a laboratory with a lot of expertise in passive sampling and, and, and mass spectrometry involved, University of Portsmouth, uh, and a number of other people that we've collaborated with in the past. Uh, we need the funding for this project in order to do a probably a year-long trial in the in the West Country, Super West Country River catchment or maybe more than one catchment. Uh, we need suitable local uh, sample deployment sites and, and the flow conditions and locations of sample points are very important. Uh, we need a, a laboratory capable of supplying fully prepared samplers uh, and the analytical service to do the requisite method development and analysis. And this has been a thorny issue in the past. Many people are interested in doing the passive sampling. My enormous frustration, there are so many projects at the trust where it would be so beneficial. It's very difficult. In fact, there isn't really a commercial laboratory that can provide the diversity of passive sampling analysis that we would want. And therefore, that's an important area of collaboration we'd be looking for. Uh, and we'd also like the facility to carry a parallel biological sampling through this trial period, because obviously what this is all about is this chemical knowledge is about trying to give us an insight into pressures and problems with the ecology uh, of water courses. So we'd be looking to do uh, look at, uh, uh, invert populations, maybe get access to things like spear indices, which give you uh, an indication of uh, seasonal impacts of pesticides, for example, uh, on, uh, on, on the ecology of rivers. So in conclusion, I think this would be the first example of a truly exhaustive trace contaminant profile of the water course. Uh, it would involve some novel chem capture based methodology, that's that's the cathode of the work, which I think actually would have a significant commercial potential if it was calibrated to some important compounds like glyphosate, that's the active component in Roundup, very well known. Uh, 
uh, herbicide, which is a, a controversial compound. There have been a lot of high profile legal cases in, in the States in connection with its, its alleged carcinogenic properties. Um, we would acquire all of the data, all of the data in this project by mass spectrometry, what's called the full scan mode. Uh, we don't particularly need to go into what that means, except that if you do that, uh, and further down the line, uh, particular pollutants become very topic or become very um, um, problematic, it's possible to go back and retrospectively look at that data you collected four or five years ago. And when you know you're looking for this particular compound, you, you, you may well be able to pull it out of the background of that incredibly complex profile we've got from uh, the same or the river. And we've certainly had evidence of significant interest in this project in the wider water industry, so amongst regulators like the EA, NRW, amongst other NGOs, amongst uh, and the water companies, uh, and also amongst um, one of our academic groups, uh, including the, the U.S. Environmental Health, I know are interested in the project. So that's it really folks, I wanted to um, reference this there, which you might find of interest, give you a bit more background, but um, I hope you agree with me that that's uh, somewhere near being the top project anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's, um, it just shows what's great about, and I'm not working at the trust, it shows you the diversity of things you get involved with. So we get quite sort of straightforward parameters that we can take and test and work with the um, public over to really quite complex thorny um, pressures that kind of no one's got a real handle for. These emerging pollutants, really trying to understand the cocktail, and our, our rivers are really kind of have a, a, a genetic signature for what's happening in the catchment. Being able to interpret that signature really tells us about what's happening across the um, catchment. So before we go into a sort of a break period, um, and there's some great questions forming that I'm trying to group into some sections, um, I'm going to hand over to Lucy um, to talk to you about the um, Plymouth River Keepers and the, the work that we've done right here at the city. Team at um, my talk today, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing here in Plymouth with communities um, to tackle some of the pollution ish issues, especially in the northwest of the city. Um, and that's been being done through two projects in particular uh, the Preventing Plastic Pollution Project, um, for which we've partnered with um, Plymouth University, amongst others, um, and also the Plymouth River Project. Um, so, uh, so I'm sure um, many of you know um, the streams in um, northwest uh, Plymouth are typically um, small urban streams, um, and a lot of them run through little pockets of ancient woodland. Um, there are a handful of farms in the north of the catchment, um, and there are a multitude of um, anthropogenic pollution um, problems um, in the catchment, um, including urban runoff. From agricultural sources in the north of the catchment, uh, issues with misconnections, uh, pollution incidents due to a constraining uh, wastewater system, um, and a multitude of issues caused by uh, litter and by tipping in the area. So, through um, PPP and uh, PRK, we've been able to take um, quite a broad approach um, to tackling these issues. Um, through PPP, we um, developed a method of um, uh, risk mapping for macro plastic pollution um, in catchment. So we, we've done this for the whole Tamar um, and uh, focused in there um, on our area in northwest Plymouth. Um, so we've done this um, uh, by collating a variety of um, open source data um, that we think um, will relate to um, plastic pollution. So these are things like land use. Uh, green spaces, um, particularly in urban areas, uh, roads, um, and also the location of um, uh, fast food um, outlets um, and other kind of things. Um, so, as you can see, um, 
This is focused predominantly around urban areas and particularly roads, uh, various kind of easy um, for litter um, and plastic, um, particular to find its way into local water sources. So having to do so, um, with that, uh, we've gone on to work uh, closely with the community uh, in the Plymouth Riverkeepers area to carry out community um, river cleans um, and litter survey. Um, so we're using the litter surveys that we're doing to ground truth um, the model that we built. Um, through the litter surveys, we've counted 2007 um, items of plastic, of which 578 were, were plastic packaging, and 339 uh, were what we've described as medium plastic pieces. So that's um, bits of plastic that are unidentifiable, um, that are basically between about 2.5 and 50 centimetres in size. Um, so we're using um, this data to help inform kind of some of our other work, um, and um, in particular to engage with businesses, which I'll touch on again later. Uh, so alongside our work to address um, plastic pollution, we're also um, carrying out work to understand and tackle some of the other water quality issues in the catchment. Um, and we're doing this um, through a number of methods, um, most of which involve the community in one way, shape or form. Um, so as Lydia was talking about earlier, earlier we've got West Country CSI volunteers in the area, um, and we're also carrying out spot sampling and river by survey. But the thing that I'm going to focus on a bit now is that we've installed a um, water quality probe um, in the stream at Terrace and Foliot um, at the bottom of one of our volunteers' gardens. And this probe is picking up data every 15 minutes on conductivity, which we're using um, as an indicator of pollution, um, as well as depth and temperature. Um, we've combined this with a trail camera that's taking um, photos every 15 minutes. So I'm going to talk through um, that data a little bit further now. Um, so this is a graph um, showing um, quite the kind of typical um, pollution event in the catchment. Um, it's the data that we've collected from the probe. So we've got conductivity data, which is the gray line, um, and then the depth is the orange line, and the blue columns is rainfall data. So you can see quite clearly that as, as there's rainfall event, um, conductivity increases. There are kind of two quite clear spikes in conductivity, um, the first of which um, is predominantly from kind of runoff from the urban environment. And the second um, is from um, sediment coming down from further on the catchment. This is backed up uh, by the photos from our trail camp, and you can see the initial plume that comes through is kind of grayish, and then it, it kind of quite literally turns brown after that. So this is quite kind of typical, the kind of thing that we would expect to see. Um, one thing to add is that um, when we have pollution events, when the conductivity has spiked particularly high, we have also contacted our CSI volunteers in the area to go out and take an actual um, survey and have a look for us. So that's been another way in which our, the community has been able to get involved. So this is a graph that you know, basically shows what might be described as a non-event. Um, it, it's the same data as the previous graph. There's no rainfall, there's no significant change in depth or significant change in conductivity. However, um, our trail cam photographs have picked up, and it's quite hard to see because of the lighting in the photographs, but you can see a kind of quick um, uh, movement of a pollution incident through the catchment. Um, and it was fairly short lived. It happened within half an hour, um, flushed through, and then um, water's clean again. So you can see in the first photograph, the water's clear. In the second one, it's a bit murky. And then in the third one, it's clear again. Um, so we're unsure as to exactly what's going on here. Um, it could be something that's um, fairly inert and non toxic and kind of nothing much to worry about. Um, but equally, there are substances that don't necessarily cause a, a spike in conductivity, 
um, but which um, can be toxic to aquatic life. So um, we're kind of just investigating um, this a little bit further now. Um, so one of the other things that we've looked at in the catchment, um, there have been repeated pollution incidents um, in which fish have unfortunately been killed in the Thompson stream. So one of the other things that we looked at was whether we were addressing conductivity spikes um, more frequently at the weekend, which was when these fish were being found. Um, so we had a little bit of a look at that, and you can see the graph at the bottom that indeed um, we are picking up higher con uh, con um, conductivity levels, um, especially on Friday, but also on Saturday. Um, we did um, do a statistical test on this, um, but it did show that, uh, that it wasn't um, statistically di significantly different to other days of the week. Um, but uh, we're sharing this data with the community. They get the data shared with them on a monthly basis. It's shared on local Facebook groups. So it does um, enable us to have a conversation with the community about things that they might be doing and what might be going on um, in their catchment. So what does all this mean? Um, and what we're doing with it all? So as well as obviously engaging um, the people that have been involved with the project so far and have involved in collecting data, um, as well as engaging them um, in you know, their local water environment, um, we're also using the information to work with the farms um, in the top of the catchment to reduce um, runoffs from, from there. Um, and we're continuing to work, do kind of outreach work in the, uh, with the wider community to attend events, um, share some of the data that we found and the photographs, and start having that conversation with people about what, what they can do um, in their own everyday lives um, to help prevent pollution in the area. It also puts data and information in the hands of you know, people who are active in the community, um, who are able to advocate and put pressure on um, you know, local influential people, politicians and the environment agency. Um, so yeah, there's a huge amount of benefits. Um, we're also um, just about to start engaging further uh, with businesses in the Thompson Folia area. Our initial engagement is going to be uh, through our plastics work, um, signing businesses up in hope to our plastic charter for change, um, and providing free plastic waste audits. Um, but that also gives us a bit of an inroad with which to start that conversation as well to find out if maybe um, there might be something they're inadvertently doing um, in running their business that might be impacting the local water environment. Um, so I think that's it. I think I've brushed through quite quickly, I don't know, but um, yeah, happy to take questions. So that's brilliant, thanks. Uh, I've got a, a series of questions that have come through the slide. So thanks for engaging that. It just means that it's easy to group um, things together. So some of the first questions were actually some um, last couple of questions here, but it was around the um, the acid um, uh, remediation about are we um, while we trying to look at the remediation on uh, borders where the rivers are coming off the planet and then normally typically um, acid. That's a good question because the rivers are um, naturally acidic. But what, uh, because of the way it dries, the rivers are, the, the wetlands are, are drying out, we're getting some flushes of water. We get flushes of, of, of that sort of really low acidity. It's almost like the summer acid. And that's the thing that's not natural. That's the thing we shouldn't be getting within there. And actually, we've done huge amounts of work over the last 20 years proving that that's not a natural phenomenon compared to the normal sort of acidic conditions up there. So it's not the fact that it's acid in first zone, it's the fact that we have these real sharp acid fluxes, which if you try to live in um, in acid for a short period of time, even if it's only a short period of time, we'll still be quite damaging. Um, and um, other questions on that was around, oh, I mean, carbon sand into the water courses, and does that cause an adverse effect? Obviously, if we were releasing, um, we could smother habitats and um, and poison habitats. Um, so one of the reasons, again, why we did it as bagged um, line to start off with, is trying to understand obviously what we're doing, which was the environment agencies would have to um, uh, permit that scheme 
are, are, are relatively um, risk averse. So it's for us to convince them that we can do it without doing any um, detrimental damage. Other questions, um, sort of, on your site, um, are there any other CSI parameters um, that can be tested as well? I think it's very important. So I don't know if you want to. Might as well come up. This is not a question. And then the other one, which um, uh, should we be pushing for more um, bathing water locations as well? Then, so what's the role of sitting with that? Um, yes, there are other parameters that we can measure. So, um, we have nitrogen strips similar to the the phosphate strips that we've been using um, and ammonia similar in, in the same vein um, and bacteria is another that can link on to the second question but um, the whole design behind the, the CSI kit is that it's economically viable as well as giving us as much information as possible so as you've seen from the map we're trying to get coverage we're trying to get as many people involved I said about the fact that it's an engagement tool as well as a data collection tool. Um, so all of these factors combine to create the kit that, that we've come up with. Now, in some areas, nitrogen and ammonia make sense. So we have, you know, got little pots of funding to try, buy, buy these, you know, nitrogen testing kits and, and, and ammonia strips. They are easily cost. So um, we've got to think about that. We've got to think about the fact that we're trying to reach as many people as possible and want to make it as accessible as possible. You know, we can get more advanced um, testing, testing kits for phosphate, we can get more advanced testing kits for dissolved solids. But we've decided that this is the best that we can get for as many of people in, in the West Country as possible. Um, on to, in terms of bacteria test kits, we've, we've, we're trying at the moment the aquagenics um, testing kit, which is in the field, but it does take the first six to 48 hours um, to incubate and get a result. A bit more involved, so it does mean that the people that want to do this and from a volunteer's perspective have to be really invested uh, in what they're doing. Um, and we're still not sure really how good they are. Really. We're only really just starting to, to trial them. Um, and that links on to the bathing water status. So to get bathing water status, as I understand it, um, Simon, probably far better answering this question than me. Um, but it's to do with how many people access the water as much as anything. Um, so, in terms of the CSI testing, it doesn't directly link, I suppose, to the bathing waters, but in terms of the observations, it can. So, I think, yes, it can adapt, be adapted um, to, to bathing water and river bathing water, certainly, which is becoming more and more um, in, in the limelight. Um, so, I'll leave it there. Um, yeah, and then some other questions on the um, phosphate side of things. I mean, there's a, a, a question of um, things like using uh, about um, high fertilizer prices. So, at the moment, the farm has gone through a, a huge um, increase in inflation and um, even more so than the, the general inflation thing. So, um, so um, uh, we are starting to see farmers acutely aware. I'm sure you're aware as well of um, the rise in prices of fertilizer, and I think we are starting to see that mindset of not um, just moving, sort of using that um, sort of willy-nilly really and making the most of of, of salaries and um, and farm manure. Although that is all going to take time. I mean, we saw a similar transition 20 years ago with pesticides, uh, where people were far more um, uh, acutely aware of, of of how to use when to sort of not misusing, not wasting pesticides. Um, there's a question about the nutrient neutrality side of things around um, if we're doing it on the camel and the axe and, and, and those um, and the sunset level, should we not be doing it anywhere? At the moment, because it's come through a, um, a, a judgment, a legal judgment against our special areas of conservation linked to um, uh, river habitats, that's why it's limited at the moment. But I think really the issue of nutrient neutrality is just a template. Um, and at some point, you probably will find that all um, rolled out on a much um, larger um, scale. Um, and then there was a, another one which um, Joe would pick up, I could pick up, or um, I'm not sure it's not in the So there's a question about um, the phosphate, um, the PA4, or whether we can distinguish how we distinguish between agricultural sources and sewerage. I mean, we, I don't know if Joe, you want to talk about but I mean, we have done, we can, we can model that. So source apportionment with GIS and that sort of things. We have also done source apportionment with license plates. Don't think you want to pick up. 
I think the main main difference is with a sewage <laughs> that's a point source, so we can monitor that. We can go there and take a sample. Whereas um, trying to capture ag agricultural sources is, is much more tricky. So I think if you get a really good idea of what the possibilities look like in the area, and we know uh, what we want to be getting to, and we know what's coming out of sewage treatment works. The difference would give us the diffuse pollution, if you like, in the area. So that's another problem. But I'm interested in Simon's point about the sewage treatment works. Um, I measured trip to fan, optical brightening agents, and stability, stability coming into the soil. Trip to fan is an effectively measure of a form of sewerage, but that can also be agricultural um, as a fecal matter. Um, and um, and optical brightening agents, the optical brightening agents is what you put in your dishwasher or your washing machine to make your wipes whiter than white. Yeah, there it goes. Um, so, what we found is actually you could quite easily pinpoint areas that would have different apportionments to different areas to the point where we showed it to one of the, the, the chair of the nature improvement area in North Devon who um, had a sewer uh, septic tank right next to one of the monitoring points that it, it, it highlighted there were some issues there. So be better. <laughs> I think about that, which is quite interesting. Um, and the, the final question here, one for Ian, which is um, should we be concerned about the immediate chloroquine? Chloroquine? So, um, do you want to pick up that one? And back, we're at the dogs in water. <laughs> uh, dogs in water. Oh, I'm riding over the bridge. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's um, so, so that's been quite high, high profile of me, um, based on some work done by um, a group at um, University of Sussex who have looked at um, inputs about uh, uh, of anti flea treatments on dogs into rivers across our of England. Uh, and there are a couple of compounds there, one of which is the rider clothes. That's that's you may have heard of neonicotinoid pesticides, but they're very they're quite high profile in terms of the one of the perceived effects on bee populations and pollinators actually. Uh, and um, <clears throat> they've, they've been banned in many parts of the EU uh, and in the uh, UK, except when the government decides it will be introduced to the use of uh, sugar beet, which is a bit controversial. But uh, yes, the minor clover is quite a nasty compound. Um, it's debatable how big the impact would be in rivers, but certainly notionally with some of the products that are used for that compound and another one called Fictivim, which is actually even worse in terms of uh, toxicity, toxicity to uh, aquatic life. Uh, when a dog has been treated um, and goes in the river, and that's what a dog does, uh, I'm not talking about that on this occasion, I'm talking about just swimming, uh, certainly those products can leach off locally into the river. Um, I don't think it's been, as far as I'm aware, Demonstrating exactly how big an impact that will have immediately locally in the water course. But my own opinion is um, it, it could well be significant in areas where, you know, there's a lot of dog walking and a lot of dog bathing. So, yeah, that's, that's what it's about. Thanks for that. Um, and again, just showed um, the, the number of, of, of pollutants, the type of pollutants, the complexities are. are, are Quite extreme. Actually, just just understanding that, or even um, sort of pronouncing sort of enunciating that, pronouncing that is, is always a challenge. Um, right. I want to move back on to the. Um, the... Go on. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yes. So moving back onto the agenda, we've got four more talks before the end of the evening. Um, again, sort of picking up some of the stuff we're looking at. Um, please do. Uh, um, use the um, slide link for more questions and I'll pick them up over the phone and do again. We'll join them in um, towards the end. So, Annabelle, can I um, bring you up? Annabelle is one of our farm advisors who's going to talk to you about the world's farm and uh, carbon and advisors. Yes, uh, then it should be. What's your favourite again? 
Right, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Annabelle Martin. I'm one of the farm advisors with West Country Rivers Trust. Um, I've been a farm advisor, I realised, for 20 years, so a bit, uh, a bit longer than two, so to speak. Um, primarily, I've done that in Devon and Cornwall, um, last 10 years with West Country Rivers Trust. Um, so, yes, I'm going to be explaining some of the science that we use in farm advice, but Hands up, confession, I am not a scientist um, by any means. When Mr T starts getting very uh, technical about chemistry, my eyes glaze and I need another cup of coffee. So um, I suppose dealing with farmers, I'm used to sort of cutting the crap and getting to the point. Um, and so I rely on scientists to give me useful information and the sort of knowledge transfer um, to, to pass on to farmers um, and how they can interpret that for their businesses. So it's great to see some farmers in the audience tonight. So what's the problem? Um, I'm not going to go into detail about this. We are often, you know, a lot of people here will be well aware of some of the issues we have, the soil compaction, um, erosion and runoff. Farmers don't want to see this any more than the rest of us as their growing medium running out of the gates, down the road, into the river. Um, they don't want to lose that valuable topsoil and they don't want the bad publicity that goes with it. I mean, mainly there's rarible issues, but obviously grassland, grassland is quite capable of generating a huge amount of running runoff if it's been poached or if it's recently receded, taking the phosphate in it. Why measure it? I mean, that, those problems on the last slide are very visible. You just have to drive or walk around in a, in a wet spell and, and you can see that very clearly. Um, but why do we measure? I mean, primarily, farmers really want to know. In my experience of visiting farmers, they really do want to know how healthy their soil is. Some of them are a bit competitive about it. Um, they also have a sort of top gear Fastest you know, lap. Um, I think there's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's never, um, it's never dull getting spade out in the field. Um, digging holes with farmers, they always want to know and they're always interested. So that's my colleague Wendy, um, the young with this model. Um, so showing farmers how to do what we call visual, visual evaluation of soil structure. So it's a bit, it's digging a bit and looking at how the soil breaks up. Um, this is. Uh, a method that's been developed over the last few years and adopted. I'm sure lots of soil scientists would enjoy having a thoroughly good argument about whether it's the best method or not, but it enables people to have um, a slightly less subjective view than normal because it attributes a, a, a value. Um, one of the best things we do, like in soil group farmers, is just normal soil sampling. So we all go and offer free soil sampling for pH, phosphate, potash, magnesium. Um, organic matter. Um, they get offered that by first line salespeople, by line salespeople, but obviously if they get it from us, they know we're not selling the product. We often will be recommending they use lime because lime's one of the best things they can do. They're using they're using fertilizers. Um, so pH again, they're very important. But a lot of farmers, they know they should sell sample. Um, they don't get around to it. They don't come around for a few years, um, so we can fill a gap there and provide them with very very useful information. But what else can we do? Um, so as well as the standard soil sample, does this have a pointer? Yeah, let's see. The serious side button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, it's it might not work. No, it's working Um So yeah, standard, top left, standard soil sample, um, we'll send that off to a laboratory. And that's where we get our pH, phosphate, potash, magnesium, organic matter. Um, but recently at West End Free, West End Rivers Trust, we set up our own soils lab. Um, and so we can now do some of the other processing, more sort of physical sampling, so like um, aggregate stability, that's in the trays, the top middle one there, um, and bulk density. So if you want to look at soil carbon, you have to, as well as measuring organic matter, you have to look at bulk density. The soil, organic matter will tell you the percentage of soil carbon, but it won't tell you the yield in per acre. So you need to do bulk density, which is it's tricky, it's very hard to get it right, and if anyone tells you it's straightforward, don't believe them, because it isn't, um, especially when it's stony soil, so um, it's got to be done properly. Um, we look at worms, um, bottom right soil structure again, that's Widdicombe Fairfield, well, it's, it's actually the car parking field. We've got beautiful soil um, structure on the right, the bottom of the hedge, and then very compacted soil on the left, where all the mines part. And then top right is my garden, so that's infiltration. Again, it's another method that's it's really useful as a demonstration for farmers and, or 
to talk about flood prevention and that sort of thing. But you've got to be very careful how you interpret the result. So that's my garden. Um, that bit of the garden is only trampled by two rather fat guinea pigs. <laughs> the, rest, the rest of us don't really get there very often. And it took 30 minutes for that to drain away. Uh, and that soil was fully wetted. So that's, that's not right. It should drain away straight away. So you've got to be careful with interpretation. What, what we do know um, is that improved soil quality is an absolute win-win for farmers. It's a win-win for the environment. There's, no, there's absolutely no conflict between improving soil quality and agricultural output. It's not a case of, well, I don't want to take that land out of production because I need that to, to produce milk or to, to produce grain. Um, we're talking about the middle of the field. We're talking about the whole field. So we want them to improve soil structure across all of the fields and to improve, improve biological activity because that leads to all those positives in red. Soil organic carbon correlates with that, but obviously if you've got the different soil types are huge, have the biggest impact on soil carbon. You can't, you, can't, you can't affect your soil carbon by your management, but on a very sandy soil, your effect is limited because the soil will grow the top. Probably going to go on. So. Okay. Um, and we know there are relationships between, between the two. And there's a lot of focus at the moment on soil carbon, obviously, payments for ecosystem services. Everybody's looking at farm and thinking, right, well, how can we, you know, what, what can we, um, can we pay farmers for the carbon in their soil? But obviously, farmers want to hold on to that for their own sort of offset. Um, it's, it's a complicated approach, and measuring soil carbon is not easy, no matter what people tell you, it isn't easy to do. But we know from our work with um, with Northwick in the past, with Jennifer Dungate, that there are some really strong correlations between soil carbon and aggregate stability. So we have a very stable soil with very good soil biology, um, with lots of globally in the sort of the soil glue, that's about as chemical as I get, um, and that holds that, that soil particle together. And so it's less erodible in rainfall. Um, that, so high, high carbon soil often has high soil aggregate stability as well. Not because it has soil, high soil carbon, but because the biology is good. So, I don't know if this is going to play, I don't think it's done. Yeah, yeah, so this is an experiment from Northwick. Um, so you see that the one on the left is grassland, with soil carbon of 30 grams per kilogram. Holds together very well in water. One's been now for 60 years, it's got half the soil carbon disintegrates immediately. And so that as, as a, you know, lots of you have seen that before, but as, as a, a visual thing for farmers, it's, it's, it's really useful. It's not disintegrated because it's got lower soil carbon, it's disintegrated because of biology. But most importantly, are the results, so we can gather all this information, but are the results meaningful and are they palatable to the farmers? It's all about interpretation. And it's all about how we put that across. So that's my colleague, Yor, Yorworth, who um, works in East Devon. I think that's the ex catchment. Um, there's nothing more valuable than going around a farm with a farmer digging holes. Um, we can all, we can go on a visit, we can take samples, you can send a report. It's much more valuable to go back with the report and talk them through it. Um, you know, it's a bit like Somebody saying, I want to see my, ch my children's test results at school, it's much more useful to talk to the teacher. Not much less influence by the outcome as well. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so it's about people. Paper's useful, reports are useful, but essentially it's about having the right people. So, Lawrence has already referred to the Devon Cornwall Soils Alliance, which was started in well, three years ago, I think, June 2019. And the aim of it was to basically to rear the sort of next gen fighters, the next generation of soil scientists. So a lot of you will recognise this chap here. Um, that's David Hogan, who's a very well known soil scientist and one of the generation that did all the soil surveys in the 1980s. He used all those amazing soil maps. Um, phenomenal knowledge. Um, again, one of those people I had to really concentrate to stay with. Um, and you can tell there, I think I'm probably thinking about lunch. I don't know if it was 
But anyway, um, the Technical Sores Alliance has over 250 members, and we run multiple training days. So we run one at Dominic's farm, one at Bisson and Bodmin, um, we run one at North Wick, I believe, and one in East Devon, which I couldn't get to. But, so the idea is to look at different soil types and to train advice in the future to understand the different soil types and their capabilities. Part of the alliance has been to do um, some feasibility reports on catchments around the West Country, all of which were failing all sediment issues under Water Framework Directive. And the idea of the feasibility studies was to understand well, several things. Was the, is the land use matched the land capability? Um, what methods would help to improve the situation? Is there enough enforcement in those catchments? What, what could be done? Um, the micro catchment surveys were about um, surface water flooding. So, um, you know, we want to continue this work into the future for the Denver Bobble Soil Alliance and to continue to sort of improve understanding and knowledge amongst future advisors. So, to sum summarise, obviously engaging with farmers over soil health is crucial. Um, they understand that for, the, for their business. A lot of them are already doing it. They're way ahead of us. Um, we learn from them. And they help us to spread the word. But you do need the right people who understand farming businesses um, and, and can talk the right language. Soil carbon is, is so topical, um, but it's, it's, I think to be treated with caution. And there are lots of other things we can measure as well that are actually more useful for, for the farmer. And then information on soil health needs to be communicated in a, in a really practical way, in a really, a really useful way. Um, and Devon and Cornwall Soils Alliance hopes to continue to do this. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, that's nice. Um, thank you, um, Annabelle. Um, and moving swiftly on, really, we're now sort of picking up um, Will Blake, uh, Professor Will Blake, who we've worked with. Oh, for like ages. Um, so, Will's going to talk to you about um, understanding sediment sources in the catch and some of the work that he's been doing across that, that field. Great, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I was trying to think myself actually about when. I think it's when I first started to be introduced when you were at the Trust as the Education Officer. So it's that long since we've been chatting to each other and, and working together as well. So I've got a few examples today just to share, some of which are directly related to work with the Trust and other things that are relevant to your own work. And so I'm a professor of catchment science. So really, I'm in a, basically the geography department. So I'm a geographer. I'm interested in patterns in time and space, how things connect, and particularly how, I guess, the natural environment responds to human impacts. And um, this is a slide I use a lot actually as a starting slide for talks. And I spend a lot of time looking on this with my students because, as you can see, once you tune your eye, you can see sediment things coming out of our southwest rivers in this picture. It's, a, I guess, quite a rare example. There's been a major storm event and then there's been clear skies afterwards. So, so the sediment things have been captured. Now, I'd particularly like to focus on how long ago that was. So, uh, yeah. I'd particularly like to focus on these. Um, the the yeah, because the colours are very different. And it's, it sort of opens up a conversation about well, what are the sources of these sediments coming out of these systems? And what can we, um, sort of, I guess, what information can we get from the sediments? And to tell us a bit about the process of taking place within the landscape. So, so that's kind of, I guess, the starting point uh, for my talk on Professor Cashman Science. I'm interested in the whole system and really interested in those interconnections. And um, so I'm here kind of representing um, quite a large research team, a lot of research effort over the years. And um, I guess if we would kind of sum up what we do and the purpose of what we do, we're doing applied research to really, we hope, inform sustainable environmental management decisions, particularly around land and water, and land and water, land and water connectivity. So as I said, we take a whole system approach. And we're really interested in soil health, because of course that was a structure and carbon and the, the biodiversity, um, but particularly in the context of soil stability, because soil erosion is one of the key uh, things that I work on and have worked on for some time. And of course, with soil erosion, as we've seen in previous talks, uh, we have all the close to downstream problems with sediments as well as sanitation. So, when we tackle the soil erosion problem through our work, we're interested in the sources and the, the drivers of that, and also the transfers and the connections and then the downstream challenges in terms of sanitation. So, we try to build up a picture of what's going on. And the pictures of the lab there, this is the consolidated radioisotope facility at the University of Plymouth. Um, because the way we try and tackle the soil erosion problem is using natural radioactivity in the environment, we look at the properties of the 
soil and tree chemical proxies. And we use those, those measurements in the lab to almost develop some kind of a fingerprint of, of the soil in different contexts. And we use it also to track and trace where and how much materials move through the system. So it's kind of an environmental forensic approach to the process side of things. Um, and as you can see, those two places at the top, these aren't in the UK, these are interesting overseas. We've got an East African situation there in Afro pastoral lands in Tanzania. And the first one on the right is recently cleared um, lands in Chile, in Central Coast in Chile. So we did a lot of work overseas. And, and I guess the, the drive of the methodologies that I use have been really driven by our collaboration with the International Atomic Energy Agency, you know, a very big environmental program. And you mentioned Lawrence earlier about the isotopes and phosphate. They, they work on these kind of things that I've like nitrogen isotopes and plant uptake and extraction of soil. And they also have a program on, on soil erosion and sediment transfer. So I've been involved with them quite a long time and it includes a lot of what we've done. Um, but we'd like to bring these tools and techniques that we develop overseas and we develop in collaboration with the IAEA. We'd like to bring those to the course and find them in our region as well. And so we've done a lot of work with this, uh, particularly developing methodologies in, in the Southwest. But I guess the other thing just to say about the overseas work we've done in this image on the bottom right is um, Kind of the methodology we've, we've developed to tackle the soil erosion challenges in Tanzania. And I suppose being solution orientated and, and forced or required to do that through the overseas development fund that we've done has really pushed us into institutional and working. So, what we've been doing the last five, six years is fitting the environmental forensics that we do into a wider jigsaw puzzle of evidence, working with human geographers, psychologists, and then working with design thinkers at Schumacher to try and bring all of the evidence and pieces together to solve those problems. And I think the parallels of what we've had today are really important because we've talked a lot about local environmental knowledge and the importance of, of listening to people who work on the land and who are spending a lot more time in the rivers than we do talking about the citizen sciences and the farmers themselves. And that's something I've learned a lot from the social sciences I work with is that we need to look at forensics alongside the information that we get from the communities as well. But on with what we want to talk about today. So a lot of projects that we've done locally and what I thought I'd do is just quickly in the 10, 10 minutes, is just give four examples of, of, I guess, headline outcomes of the kind of things we can get from the methodologies that we use. So, on the left is showing some of our seven traps. If you tune in, you can see, like many of those have been seen so far, quite a lot of silt on that roof bed. Really interested where that's come from and what was the land management practice that's been driving the origin of that silt. So, quite interested in the, in the origin and the dynamics of silt in this downstream. So, one particular example where there's a restored wetland. On the river Dart in Colness, which also shares a bit of information from you, uh, with you. Um, and then think about the wetland itself and the sediment that's built up in it. What can we gain from that sedimentary archive? When we drill down into the sediment, we're basically drilling back through time. And what can the traces that we use tell us about how sediment patterns have changed through time in a particular system? And then we've talked a bit about phosphorus. I just wanted to show you a few examples of how, how sediment connects as a vector, the phosphorus transfer. But also storage within the river basin and what that means in terms of future um, situations. If, if phosphorus is stored up within the river bed and we do a whole load of work within the river catchment to solve phosphorus inputs to the river, will it still be leaking out of the sediment system um, for years to come? And will it, is that something we should be concerned about? Which brings us on to the final point, which is the work of my PhD student, um, Nico Minos, or also known as Gabo, who's in the room today. I'll just tell you a little bit about his work, which is all about how we use natural radioactivity. To try to tell you how long this sediment sticks around within the river basin. So that's kind of the, um, I haven't used my 10 minutes up already, so that's kind of where we're going. Um, so we're on with the show. Um, so this first um, piece, this is the uh, Queen's March. So those of you I live in Thomas, and those of you familiar with the Dart and the Dart and the States know that there was a piece of work done to um, to take what was a, a water meadow, if you can see in the bottom left there, it was, it was managed in terms of water levels, it was, it was drained. And periodically, half will be turned out when the conditions were right. And they wanted to convert that into something a bit more natural. So, West Country Rivers were involved in, in planning what to do next with that. And you'd see the works part in progress to convert it back to something a bit more natural, a bit more of a wildlife haven, something that would flood, and something that would capture a bit more sediment within the system. And so, in parallel to that, we wanted to um, think a little bit about where the sediment was coming from, you think about the sediment sources and how. Or might be done upstream, might be affecting the delivery of sediments that restore the system. So, we applied um, our sediment tracing techniques. So, it essentially involves taking a lot of soil samples from around the catchments, bringing them back to the lab, and analyzing them with the geochemical fingerprints. So, measuring lots of different stuff in the lab. And you see, sort of, we, I won't get too much into the data, but 
Essentially, what we hope is that the different sediment sources will look different to each other geochemically. Then we can look at the sediment downstream and see which one that those that match the best to. And it might be a mixture. So we end up sort of showing you through statistical models looking at the best fit of the sediment downstream to what's been coming through the from upstream. So in this particular case, um, there's an interesting story about data structure, which I might park. Maybe if you were interested, can come back to it in that one, because we actually end up with two different results from our models. And the first model was telling us how most of the sediment was coming from cultivated lands, which is kind of what we would have expected. But when we scrutinised the data, we realised that the cultivated lands in the upper part of the catchment had a very different signature to the cultivated land in the lower catchment. And so the fingerprint was very broad and really widely spread. And so we partitioned the data into two different component parts, the upper and the lower. And when we did that, the model actually gave us different And it told us most of the sediment was coming from the pasture, from the pattern pasture across the system. It was a really interesting example for us as, as data scientists, I guess, in that we plug our evidence into a model. And if we don't scrutinize the data in a lot of detail and carefully think about what we're putting into our model, we, the answer that we get out is always going to be an answer. So the model always gives us an answer. And what we fed in was really, really broad. And because the fingerprints of the cultivated soil were so broad across the piece, it was easy for models to fit to it because, of, because that fingerprint covered everything. So, oh, that's what it is. But actually, when we, when we partition the data, so I have told you to partition data, the story having to say we're going to do it. But when we partition the data, we actually got the answer which we felt was more credible. And when we walk the catchment, as you can see in the region to the left, you can see you actually tracked, you can track the sediment through upslope into some really quite compact departure levels and get across the catchment. So I think what's interesting about this, and it's the forensic story, is kind of a cautionary message that we have to apply these things with care. And then cross validation, of course, with automation is really important. Um, so in the Queen's Marsh, which um, before it was converted and all that work was done, we were really keen to drill down into that and take sediment <coughs> sequence out of it. So we drilled a core there and so we were working there with our colleagues from Ethiopia and Tanzania who came across the training programme. And Rupert there, who's over in the same with Rupert sat hand with pretty much all the projects I'm talking to you about today. And what we do is we drill into the sediment. And then those sediment layers basically give us a history of, of, of the sediment inputs to that marsh over time. And we go and make the radioactivity from data so we can actually work out how old those sediments are. And we look at the properties of the sediments to see how things have changed. And just one example again. So this is the, um, the contemporary bits at the top of the floor. This is going back through time. So the black line is telling us the sedimentation rates through time. You can see that the sedimentation rates come up, particularly in the post war years, the sedimentation rates increase. And then with the eye of faith, maybe there's some kind of decrease in the top. And the green line is the amount of phosphorus within that sediment. Be able to see this increase. So what we're seeing in the sediments is a historic record of what's happened in that catchment. And so we apply our forensic tools to that. We do lots of work on floodplains all around the region. We can start to build up evidence of what have changed. And I guess the question on this one in terms of the sedimentation rates is is this spike here an anomaly and the total trend is upwards, or is this spike where it's worse than actually yeah. the last 10, 15 years things have been improved? The catchment sense of farming. So that's the kind of question that we want to try and answer with our floodplain work. We've got something very similar from the Avon actually, which shows the same pattern, a decrease in the last 10, 15 years in sediment. So that's something that I think we're really keen to pursue to look at evidence of, of I guess, um, improvements in the situation with management practice. Um, a quick detour, slightly out of the region, but it's, it's a nice study, it's a different sediment of people in the study, because we've been, again, it seems to be doing work in these studies. Um, this is one example, this is the plant in fact, where there was a place with the plant muscle case um, where the population was in decline. And so the question was, well, where's the sediment coming from? And to cut a long story short, what we realised when we looked at this seasonally was that the dominant source of sediment in the spring and the summer was coming from agricultural lands. That's the green spike here, so the more it is to the right of the greater amount from that particular source. But when we looked at the winter data, it switched to channel back on the main channel. And that was because the, the system had come up from a big rate of hydrological heat, because extra runoff coming down the system, and my parent clearance, and that had actually created a, a channel bank erosion problem downstream. But that was triggered, of course, by the, the runoff coming from our catchment. But it was, it was the secondary effect of the runoff in terms of channel bank erosion within that system. So, again, it kind of shows us how we need to get this jigsaw puzzle to friends, it's concerned a little bit about what's happening within these systems and how they change through time. I 
Um, so yeah, second to last point. It's just a quick one then thinking about the phosphorus bin in these systems. It's a work with Lawrence and the team on, um, on the talk. And the interest there was in the status of the sediment quality within the system under different circumstances. And I'm just really showing you these two maps to give you a sense of the, the different footprints of different sources. We've talked quite a lot about diffuse versus point sources of phosphorus. This is what the sediments telling us. So on the right, we've got um, sediment from the um, which is up the dodge on the right. And you can see this is a quite a, a well um, quite so to be farm past the system, quite high levels of phosphorus within those sediments and quite consistent. Because when we look at the upper tour, you can see from the um, around Altorton, very high levels of, of phosphorus, which then decline as you go downstream. And so what we're seeing is the difference between the point sources from the water feedback works and the um, and the industry there compared to the footprints of the diffuse pollution from agricultural lands. And so again, these circumstances, we need people well, the next question is, well, how long is this sediment hanging around for? And how stable is the phosphorus on that sediment? So we did a bit of work, we then, it was a master student, did some work with DGTs, we also did some chemistry work to see how easily phosphorus would come off the sediment. A lot of phosphorus was ironbound, so it was kind of stable in oxygen conditions, but once it had moved downstream and to somewhere with a little bit less oxygen in the sediment, it could easily be released. Um, and then the DGT work showed that actually in the presence of calcium within the sediment, the surface of the phosphorus was actually quite well bound. I know that's, that's actually the, the role of calcium has actually become, um, has been uh, part of phosphorus management systems in the lakes, in the false stock of the product, and calcium is able to lock the phosphorus up. So we see within the natural system some of the chemistry dynamics of how easily that phosphorus might or might not be released from the sediment. And that leads me just to the last um, component parts. This is the work that Gabby is undertaking. So he's really picking up on this point that by sending resident time within the rivers and within the river gravels is something we really need to get a handle on. Because if the sediment is hanging around for a long time, it's polluted, it could potentially become a secondary source of pollution in the future. So what Gabby is doing is applying these different radioisotope signatures to work out a little bit about how long the sediment has been sitting within the system. And in a nutshell, the William 7 is a radioisotope that's very short lived. And it comes down with the rainfall, it labels the topsoil, and it gets washed into the rivers. And after 53 days, we see a, a, a reduction of half in the activity concentration, so it's about 53 day half life, compared to the later temperatures, a 22 year half life. And so, if those two radioisotopes come off the land together and then they get deposited in the stream, over time, the brilliant sediment slowly reduces in concentration. If the brilliant sediment goes up, the pressure inputs, and it declines down to zero, then it's been sitting around for a long time. So essentially what Gabby is doing is he's tagging whether the sediment is coming in as it's old or it's new. And you can turn that into an estimate of how long it's coming around for. And um, there's a lot of detail here, but I think this is Gabby's preliminary work. He's seen some really interesting dynamics in sediment storage within gravel bars. He sees spatial patterns within gravel bars, where in the tail of the bar, you see a much greater turnover and lots of sediment than in the head of the bar, for example. And he's also seen differences in overall residence time between what channel morphologies you might expect in flow dynamics. So what his early work has shown is that these radio isotope signatures can be really useful in telling us a bit about the sediment dynamics within the channel, but particularly within the gravel bed, then the habitat of modern wildlife within the lake. So I think that's quite a nice link then to the what we hear next from Rupert, which is all about gravel augmentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabby. Um, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Gabby and Lawrence to sort of talk about the implications of the work that they've done so far. Uh, that's great. Thanks um, for that. Well, in other ways, there's a plethora of uh, different studies and information that, that um, that's come down. And obviously, sort of the issue there of, of, of having increased sediment into our rivers um, causes huge problems with um, spawning gravels. Um, uh, the other thing that causes problems with spawning gravels is you have something that's cutting off small gravels to move downstream, which is a bit of sort of uh, stuff. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, the graphic dynamics project that we've been looking at on the River Avon, where we've been looking at using gravel augmentation as a restoration technique. So the River Avon, uh, we've been looking at the, the gravel story downstream of the dam. 
on the east end of Tumon, which is nice. So you can see the, the Avon down at the top of the, the picture on the right there. Um, and by having a barrier like that, it, um, it, it kind of depletes the natural flow of gravels that would form the gravel beds that the salmon would be spawning on. So over time, if you've got a, um, a dam or some kind of barrier like that, you're going to lose the habitat that you would naturally have for the fish to spawn in. So by uh, augmenting the channel in these depleted areas with extra gravels, we can look at um, how uh, we, we can look at improving the habitat. So the MR project was to try and determine um, what what the dynamics of the gravel moving within the channel would be to try and inform the kind of frequencies that you might need to add extra gravels uh, in the future. And we're particularly looking at the River Avon on here, but we've also done some similar work um, up in Somerset uh, below the Sutton Bingham Reservoir as well. So to start off with, the gravel gets tipped out on site and then uh, a telehandler dumps it into the river and budding volunteers, fortunately this was before I was involved in the project, but budding volunteers would help to rake out the gravel so that it's not impeding the flow. Um, we had uh, 13 sites, I think it was, yeah, 13 sites that the gravel was augmented at um, over the period 2014 to 2020. And it amounted to um, just over 1,200 tonnes of gravel. So this is starting from up at the top of the map there by the dam down to Dinsworthy Bridge. So that's what it looked like once the volunteers had spent hours uh, raking the gravel out. And the following day that happened. So <laughs> the river came up with a bit of spate flow. It's a very high energy river and the following day it was it was like that. So um, the volunteers did a really good job, um, but on this occasion perhaps their efforts weren't quite needed. <laughs> so um, it is a high energy river here. Um, typically um, we're getting flows in space of up around a metre, occasionally up around 1.4 metres. You can see the sort of timeline along the bottom there, uh, January 2013 to 20, well, just about 2020, showing that we do get seasonal pattern of um, higher flows. Uh, and on occasions we've had we've had some very big peaks, um, over one and a half metres, and those are the sort of flows that really push the gravels down the channel. So in terms of the methods that we used for the study, um, we wanted to examine some reach scale dynamics by using radio frequency ID tagging of particles. Secondly, we wanted to map um, audit river scale gravel habitat dynamics. So looking at whereabouts within the river, the, the gravels were, were ending up. And also to sort of determine the kind of processes that are happening, how the gravel is moving, the times it's taking to move, um, and the kind of um, force of the river that's needed to move the gravel down the stream. And we were doing that using impact plates. So in terms of the RFID tagging, uh, we collect a bunch of cobbles from the big pile, um, stick these radio frequency ID tags onto them, and each of these it has its own unique ID. So you can make a note of what its ID is, uh, and then once we've seeded all the rocks in the augmentation zone, uh, at a later date we can come back out. So each each sort of period of augmentation of the gravel, we would, we would seed the area with sort of up to 200 tags. And then one of our volunteers, uh, this is Claire, who's just just completed her PhD. I'll just have it awarded. And um, we were going to the river twice a year with the radio frequency ID tag reader. So a range of about 45 centimetres. So as long as you're within about 45 centimetres, um, you would hear a little ping, and then you could call out the ID code that's displayed to somebody bank side to record, and then we would locate that the, the exact position with GPS. So over time, we could see from where that tag was originally seeded in the river, where it moves downstream. 
second method we used for the three view audience, we um, did a walkover of the site uh, using handheld GPS, and we were monitoring the size of the gravel deposits down the river and looking at whether they were very large down to very small. Their location within the river and left bank uh, in the middle of the channel or right bank, whether above or below the waterline. Um, year on year surveys, you started to see a difference in colour as the, the, the gravels are starting to sort of pick up um, um, from in water. So there were seven reaches that we did for the fluvial audience, which uh, stretched from um, sort of nearest to the dam to uh, down to Penn State Cox, which is just short of uh, six kilometers of the dam. And the third method we used was the impact plates I mentioned. So these are a very heavy concrete block with like a seismic plate mounted inside it. And that gets attached to the riverbed. And then um, as, as cobbles are carried in the, in the water and they hit this, it records a ping and um, when you download the data, you, you can sort of see how many cobbles have, have hit it according to the given time period. So in terms of the results, this is the upper section that we surveyed. Um, in the table on the right, you can see 0 0.7 as a minimum distance. So it didn't move very far, but it's quite likely that that's where a cobble got trapped behind a, a large boulder. These are like big granite boulders within the river channel, or it could have uh, been thrown up out of the water and it's, it's just sort of landed on the bank. Uh, the other figure to make note of here, Digworthy, February 2018, we had a recovery rate of 10.6%. So that's a huge number of the, of the tagged particles we didn't find. Now, whether that's because they were out of reach when we were surveying, it's really difficult to get complete coverage, sort of waving the detector around and trying to go back over the same bit whilst you're walking on really slippery rocks. Um, but it's possible that some of those tags got carried out of the system beyond what we were measuring, or there are some very deep pools in there that I couldn't get to the bottom of, so they could have ended up in the bottom of those. Uh, we did a, a detailed sort of backside survey, uh, and then we plotted the data on it. The colours here, it's sort of, it is red, uh, represents the 2013-2015, blue is, is sort of like that. But you can see that a lot of them were actually outside of the channel uh, when we found them. Um, and that's where in spake flows, the cobbles have just been carried and thrown out of the river channel. So they're lying bankside where at another spake flow, they could be remobilized uh, or some of them could be trapped um, under, under vegetation. So as you'd expect, um, smaller particles would travel further, but the relationship wasn't incredibly strong. And we think that that's down to the fact that there are a lot of embayments or large boulders where cobbles are getting stuck. So it's not just the amount of energy that you're getting a spake flow that is carrying the gravels down through. Um, one of the factors to, to sort of think about is um, how many obstructions are there that, that could catch the gravels. So on to the, um, the audits, these are the kind of areas where they're getting, getting caught. So this is the sort of back side behind the boulders, and this, this is like a small embayment where the gravels have just sort of landed. And in time, when there's a spake flow, and then we start getting sort of swollen circulations, that will get lifted up and it will carry on moving downstream. Um, so these, these are the seven reaches that we did for the gravel audits, and you can see in these graphics here, this is the number of gravel um, deposits per kilometre stretch of audit. And the other figures to, to note on here, uh, in the final column, this is the, um, the percentage change. So the increase in numbers, the increased percentage of um, gravel deposits from the previous season. So you can see that from the start of augmentation, we were getting more and more deposits, separate individual deposits through the survey period until the last survey when a lot of the deposits had kind of 
join together in effect and, and almost become one as, as the gravel was, was sort of dissipating down through the, the channel reach. That's illustrated a bit more clearly here, where in October 2016, the red dots are showing the augmentation points, the black dots are showing where the gravel deposits are, and then by May 2020, you can see it's almost a sort of sinuous line of gravel deposits down through the channel. So you can see that from the injection point, you, you, you're getting a clear movement of gravel downstream to rejuvenate those, those gravel beds to spawn. Um, this is illustrating it again, where at the start of each reach, each reach is a separate colour. The start, there's very few. By the end, you've got much, a much sort of denser spread of um, deposits down through. And just this is um, sort of silly showing it, but here we're starting off with the purple is showing a lot of very large deposits, but when we get down to 2020, the large deposits have gone, and it's a much smaller spread of um, material. And then on this side, we can see that um, the, uh, the majority of the deposits are being sort of captured in these sort of channel embayments. So where there's a bit of a meander, it's getting caught just, just around the edges, um, rather than um, lots of it being held within the channel, because of it being such a, a sort of high energy stream. Um, in terms of the impact plates, you can see here the red arrows are showing when the augmentation took place. Um, the, the black lines are showing the, the number of impacts recorded, and that ties in with the higher um, flow. So this is the um, flow above base level. Uh, and it worked, so, so there's quite a, quite a sort of uh, correlation between that. Unfortunately, we did get the impact plate flipping. So although they're secured into the ground and they're really heavy plates, um, it flipped over and you, can't, you cannot go in to um, recite it in that situation. So unfortunately, we, we lost some of the data there. Uh, the impact plate is in this picture. I think it's there, but they are quite tricky to see. So to conclude, um, gravel dynamics are a function of particle mobility mediated by high retention. So when there's a lot of big boulders or, or meanders and embayments within the river, they'll, um, they'll kind of trap the particles and, and sort of slow them from moving downstream. So it's the stream power is sort of secondary to that. Uh, our monitoring suggests that we'll need to carry on um, uh, augmenting with gravel to to keep the habitat at its current level, but over time you can reduce the amount of uh, augmentation. So we're thinking now probably around a sort of five yearly time scale at perhaps three locations. Um, and I think really, yeah, really pleasingly, it's showing that it's worked since the start of the project in 2015. Um, the the upward trend in both salmon and trout species has has improved. Thank you very much. That's, that's great. Uh, thanks for that, Rupert. And I mean, it's, um, I, we'll, uh, we're running slight behind, so um, we'll, I'll, I'll be picking up um, those questions at the end as well. Um, but I'd like to hand over to Simon, who's going to take our last talk of, uh, of today, really about the filling and um, the kind of knowledge he's gleaned over the last five years over natural health management. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks very much for coming along. So it's so good to be here. Yeah, as Doris uh, gladly pointed out, this is kind of a bit of a journey with me through my uh, recent years in being asked to monitor um, what we tend to call natural flood management um, interventions um, or individual flood risk management measures, if we like. But essentially, natural flood management. So this is this is a picture of a, a leaky dam. Um, it's essentially an informal kind of structure. Um, as you can see, it's essentially a, a tree trunk that we've been found nearby or chopped up there and pinned into the, into the river bank with good stairs. So, this is kind of uh, also known as a leaky dam because it, it does just that. Um, why this is important is that we've heard earlier on today about you know, the challenges around soil compaction, increased runoff, climate change, bringing more intense rainfall events. And that is really shown in, in evidence in our channels, our river channels, our streams, particularly in the small streams going more and more incised and working down into their beds. But once they start doing that, it's really a one-way journey. We lose that connection with the floodplain. 
which is really beneficial for you know, keeping a diversity in habitat and cattle form. Um, so the other thing I think to point out is uh, relates to what Annabelle was saying about how important soil condition is to, to managing runoff. Um, and so these in-stream structures uh, or leaky dams are really just one tool in our armory, if you like, to tackle this problem. And they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, some more or less natural. Um, as you can see, this is basically a couple plates and holes drilled in, and then as a central notch and some stones downstream to stop that erosion downstream in high flows. Uh, another kind of popular design guide, if you like, is this sort of general X shape. So it, it funnels, it's supposed to carry um, concentrate flow in the center of the channel in high, high flow conditions. Um, you can also see we see these up a lot on sort of on where they're regressing moors, where it's a more formal structure retaining water in it, but in behind it all the time. Um, again, not particularly natural, although it might be using natural materials. And here's one from an example from the US where they're really trying to mimic. So there's the same structure in uh, cross section and profile view, really trying to mimic the, the constructions that beavers will make, a much less formal um, presentation to the river, river itself. Like this, one of the key considerations with these things, if you try it down a river, you'll find a way around it and through it or under it or over it. Um, and so something like this is much more diffuse and presents a more sort of amenable obstacle, if you like, to, to river flows. But one that we see an awful lot of at the moment is these, I call them moss track dams. This is, and the reason why is this is the official guidance, if you like, from the Rural Payments Agency, who, who dish out payments to farmers and landowners for installing these structures on their land. So if I was a farmer, yes, I'd pay attention to what this diagram says. What is interesting and problematic about this design, if you like, a number of things, but one is notice the, the, you know, the very flat and level uh, riverbanks uh, on the flat plane. We don't see that very often. And then the, the gap between, the idea of that is it lets low flows pass unhindered, which is kind of a good thing. Um, it allows fish to move freely. Um, and only in high flows does that present a barrier that starts to back up the water. The issue I have is that 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 height is absolutely crucial. Um, you get that wrong when you're talking about it doesn't come into play often enough or it comes into play too often. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note is as soon as you install that structure in the river, you lose all control over that height as well because the river itself will, will sort of amend it. Um, and we'll come on to that in a minute. But what you see here then is what tends to get put in. It's very typical, you know, it's, it's sort of, an, of a sort of it's inspired by that design, but it's had to meet with, you know, um, uneven and sloping channel banks. And so what you get is, is um, close, but not quite. Um, now we can monitor these structures. Uh, we uh, set out measuring, so one of the aims is to slow down flood peaks. So we put a, a water level sensor in <coughs> right by the dam, and one downstream of the whole lot, one upstream. We look at the travel time or the timing between the peak at the top and the bottom. So uh, the day after that dam, this is the same dam from the front first slide. The day after it was installed, or two days later, we had storm Garrett or Frey on the other. And we measured the, so the blue line is the downstream peak, and the uh, blue line is the upstream depth. But yes, we corrected. There's two hour delay between the upstream and downstream. Bingo, job done. Um, a few days later, the next storm comes along, and somehow we managed to have the, um, the downstream peak before the upstream peak. <laughs> I think this is possibly because you can see this wobble on our data here. That that sort of vertical uncertainty in in level translates into quite a sizable, you know, ten or twenty minute uncertainty in timing. So it's probably about the same sort of time, but it's just that's that's the amount. And one of the one of the reasons for that difference in peak is that what happens, if you remember the first slide, is that hole has been blown out under the dam. So those high high energy flows hitting this first in the sequence of dams. It makes a great big hole underneath, and so it's much, much less effective now as a leaky dam. Someone's pulled the plug out, basically. Um, but this same structure, so yeah, we can, we can measure how effective these are. Um, this again shows things. So this time, from, so the, the green line, green line is the um, the water level at the dam itself, and the yellow line is upstream, so outside the hydrological influence of the dam. So essentially, lots of water coming into the system. And the water that's held up behind that dam. What happened here? I think our level sensor moved up inside the tube, so it gave us a little bit of data. Fortunately, we had the images from the trail camera, which 
which showed us that the water level did indeed do what the red carbon does. So you can see that although as the as the yellow line kind of peaks and troughs, we are holding some water behind the dam, which you can see going on here. So as the water's flowing in, it's it's holding up behind the dam. Um, if you translate that or convert that water level into a flow, you, you get some figures there. I don't know if you can see the numbers, but essentially the red line then is the storage above what's coming in. And that equates to about a peak of nearly 700 litres um, or a period of time where it's stored you know, 500 litres over about an hour or, or two. Um, put that into context, in a stream like that, we sort of estimated that it might be might easily be flowing at one cubic metre a second. So what you've got, if you imagine you drop that dam into the, into the channel in, in an instant, it would essentially fill in, in a few seconds. So I think if you put that into the context of what Amber was talking about, if you can improve soil condition over hundreds of metres or you know, heck, a, a few acres, that might make a much bigger difference. The other issue we have is, as I said before, is, is the river is, is going to, all the streams going to be quite um, objectionable to these structures being there. So this is in the same sequence of leaving dams, this is the leaving dam here, and within um, six months, so over a winter period, that's the erosion that's caused around the side of the dam. So just where you have an X shape, it funnels flow through the old nooks and crannies. When you funnel flow through, you increase the erosive power. And this, this is what can result. This one here, again, we've got the X, X shape funneling flow underneath. And what you've got there is a very shallow stream with a very deep, you know, half a meter deep pool underneath, or downstream from the dam. So it's causing, um, as these structures evolve in the face of high flows or storm conditions, you get a lot of variability starting to introduce. Into, this, into what was quite a uniform stream channel, but um, over a very short period of time, your structures are evolving and disintegrating effectively, so you can't really rely on them for um, very much, very long. What that reminded me of, and Crystal, Crystal liked this slide from Dean Trust, um, so essentially what that reminded me of is this is what we started with here. We've got an incised channel, and this is where the, the problem, if you like, is, we're talking about land management and increased rainfall events, that's where the problem seems most apparent. It's where you see the deeply incised channels, really fast floods and high in, uh, really fast water in high flow conditions. And what we've kind of unwittingly done by installing the leaky dams is actually start to create this, this new soil, this sort of lateral erosion and the and the longitudinal erosion in the, in the channel, which start to introduce this kind of diversity in channel form. So if we stopped it there, that would be kind of fine. That's you know, that's um some diversity, which we didn't necessarily intend, but it started to happen. But as you scroll on, and this is what, what beavers were making about, they come in and they kind of, they, they can deal with that, and find that very hard to deal with, it's a very angry system. But on this stage, you kind of, they move it into sort of wetland creation and, and a much more sort of natural system. What is also interesting though, is that if you were a farmer, you might be quite happy with that, and that might not be too bad. You might have a bit of an argument about that if you didn't plan on that happening, I guess. And I think that's that's part of the, the issue with um, this. This kind of structure is that on the face of it, you can have all the benefits of, you know, reduced flooding, but it, you don't have to give any land back. So the stream channels here, there's a woodland, and you can see the fence line here. So the farmers not had to yield any space to the river. This is a kind of conceptual diagram that kind of illustrates the point again. So on the far right hand side, now we've got a, a very straight and sized channel. The red arrow represents kind of flow velocity and the, the blue is shallow water and the, the dark blue is deeper. So as you start to introduce the, the, the barriers or flow diversions we could do, we start to send water either side of those, which scales out deeper sections and also encourages deposition either side where the, where the flow is slower. So you start to get these deeper and shallow sections, which of course reflects actually or encourages um, more biodiverse habitats or biodiverse or more diverse flow conditions and, and kind of more biodiversity and end up with you know, your overall velocity being much slower over much more of piece, which is much healthier for you know, the, the environment, essentially the aquatic environment and the, and the hydrological environment as well. But notice we are starting as well to move that stream sideways. So it's, very difficult to get all the benefits you want if you're still trying to keep the stream within its channels. 
Um, so again, how, how does that change the way we, we look at monitoring these uh, streams? Well, what you've got the picture there is of um, is of a stream that seven or eight months before that was basically a ditch. So it had been cleaned out, straightened, um, animals had access to it, they needed all the vegetation, and it was again on the one way trip down into its bed. Um, we did install, or the, the landowner installed some leaky dams in there, and they are starting to exhibit that it's a typical kind of um, introducing variability, at least into the channel. Some of them are holding water, some of them aren't. They're not designed to, but they're doing it anyway. Um, but what you can see here is what, what we we think is the return of sort of more natural conditions. So you're starting to see things like vegetation returning, largely, largely in part because of the, the animals we get out, but also because some of the finer material and that uh, is being retained in the system rather than everything being shot on through. Um, it's also, we get um, different uh, rock sizes and gravel sizes, so it's bringing that uh, vegetation back. We've got some older saplings starting to grow in there. So over time, when our leaky dam structures have kind of disintegrated, done their job, and maybe gone, um, we may well still have a more natural system here that's kind of self sustaining because there's more vegetation falling into the channel and kind of providing that roughness and that infiltration itself. And it struck me as well that actually the type of monitoring we're talking about there, rather than relying on sensors and people like me and Holly and Lydia coming out and downloading and processing data and then finding, you know, writing reports, we're looking at more holistic monitoring and more holistic management, if you like, of the river system. So this is a diagram from the River, river Habitat Survey, um, which is a scheme which volunteers can take part in and, and you know, can adapt that. And you can see the kind of things we're looking at is vegetation types, you know, channel morphology. So we're looking for that senior soil um, uh, characteristics to come back. And we're looking at um, land use and vegetation structures. So it's much more holistic management or holistic monitoring of rivers that I think um, actually helps to give us a much better um, understanding of the entire system rather than all our hope and potential on these in, in these um, isolated structures. Okay, so that's, that's me on, on that. Yeah. Well, that's the, um, the kind of end of the, the, the presentation, the, the, um, the speed dating exercise um, of, of WRT and the science we do and the trying to turn science into understanding. I think is the key thing that we're really trying to push this evening is, is that um, it's quite easy to get technical quite quickly. What's hard is to turn that into some real insight and understanding. I'm, I'm not going to dwell too much. I'm going to run through some of the questions. But apologies for the speaker. I'm just I know there's a few people who will need to leave. Um, but really, there's some, some interesting questions. A lot, a lot of ones on the uh, the gravel introduction route side, but more on probably our side around. Um, Sort of, uh, why are we doing this? Sort of, what's the long term picture? Should we not be just moving the dam? Now, in these instances, the dams are, are what's giving us our drinking water, um, what gets extracted um, for um, to go into the water treatment. So, it's something which will be there and will be there for a long time, especially with the yield rate and surface flow catchment. So, conversations that the water often to have is how they mitigate for the impacts of things like we choose. Um, fish spawning and um, downstream because you don't have that transport. Um, so questions there about whether sort of that gravel becomes uh, sedimented. Um, well, because of the fact that those uh, reservoirs cut off everything effectively by the water, you don't tend to get the same amount of sedimentation that you would in some of our other streams. But the further down you go, the more inputs you'll get within that. In terms of the costs of that, um, well, they vary across the different um, examples we're, we're trialling. Um, it's around £25,000 a year for the sample, the, the putting them in and monitoring and doing all that work. So for us, it's around, does it work? Does it get there? And that's the question we, we keep coming back to, is it, is it worth it there? They're very site-specific. So sometimes, in other captions, actually we do a lot of habitat restoration rather than the gravel augmentation. Um, questions over other places like Mevi and Burratore. Those are other examples where we can look at this technique as well and start saying, is it appropriate there? But it's very site specific. So we do have to, to look at that detail. Um, some other things that are interesting there are about whether that sort of research supports the, the need for re wiggling of, of our river. Um, and I think that brings into sort of what Simon was saying about this increasing geomorphology, increasing space for our rivers. And I think. That's a really interesting question because what we've done over the years is constrain our rivers. We've, we've straightened them, we've narrowed them, we've deepened them, we've put in a lot of barriers, a lot of features 
that um, because as a, we're 60 million people living on a small island, so it's not surprising you've done that. So whether it be there's a question around beavers and just beavers can create these sorts of things, or if they can, um, the challenge is, is we've restricted our environment and so they will naturally come into conflict with a lot of other things, whether it be bridges, weirs, flood features that we have already, things like trash streams. So there's a trying to broaden our rivers and give our rivers more space is a key um, action of what sort of West Country Rivers Trust is, is trying to do. And what that does is it deconflicts that space. So if farmers are prepared to lose that land, then it's an easier land to sort of start saying, well, look, we want to increase the, the channel morphography. Um, geomorphology there, sorry. Um, and then the final question was one around um, the soil side of it and the sediment loss from wills, which is around erosion, is a natural process. Um, so when does a natural process become a problem? Um, and what's, we know that sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of soil sediment company, any, anyone who remembers their sort of uh, secondary school geography and Oxbow lakes and erosion and banks and berms and all those sorts of things knows it's a natural process. The challenge we have, as I showed you in the very first slide, is we see in compaction on our rivers, on our soil, on our land, um, increase dramatically. The recent ones is um, surveys of 30, um, uh, 39% of our soils are heavily, uh, severely uh, compacted. Now, what that means is not only are they losing soil, but the water is running off, increasing erosion, increasing the soil loss. So, yes, it does cause huge um, problems across society, whether it be from flooding, a drought, for, flood, uh, for um, water pollution um, or sedimentation of our, our harbour or in, in this sort of um, big things like the spawning grounds. Anyway, so there's a huge amount in there. I've really enjoyed tonight and I've really enjoyed you guys being able to come out face to face. It's the first time we've held an event for pretty much two and a half years. Um, so I just wanted to thank you and thank the speakers. Um, and yeah, good evening and I hope you have a pleasant trip home. <laughs>